you guys are the real evil bastards who plan to take over and, you know, move your mushrooms into the heads of everybody and start controlling human beings and animals or whatever. I have no idea where this ontological design shit is going, but I love it. And just reinstall install mortality into these processes and force you to the ground. And after that, you could do ontological design that can be absolutely fantastic. And then if Elon wants to live forever, that can be his little prerogative. He's, he's after all, the closet plate list among the five of us. I don't think anyone, anybody else is, but you know. Well, yeah. that's, that's we love him for it. <laughs> okay, so I'm writing a book tentatively called Process and Event with Jan Söderqvist. So it's going to be a sixth book. So we're going to be equal with Hegel here, having written six books. It's going to come out next year. And uh, a central part of the book, uh, chapter six to nine, are going to be about something that we call transcendental emergentism or emergence vector theory. And we're making a very, very, very serious attempt at redoing metaphysics properly. We, you know, we're redoing all the narratives, basically. So we're saying that civilization started some five to 10,000 years ago, and we developed written language, and we started permanently settled in places and got fat and obese because of it and have a problems with that ever since. But it's called civilization. Uh, human beings really do not change at all. Technology changes. So we, we know the sort of basic premises, at least for Bart and Sodica's philosophy. And I'd love to bring up these topics on the intellectual deep web over the last year. And I've discovered that all four of you guys are really great with this. Like you understand how difficult metaphysics is, but how much fun it is to actually dig into it. It's the ultimate philosophical challenge. It's the ultimate challenge if you're smart or intelligent to go into metaphysics. So then I discovered, of course, like a lot of people have, that Elung and Ebert share first name with me. And one of the things I'm going to claim when I'm rewriting history with Jan Söderqvist is that the real hero of antiquity was Alexander the Great. Like any guy who has heroes and who wants to be a soldier when he grows up or a warrior knows that Alexander the Great was the real shit. The guy who died at the cross has been incredibly overrated. And instead, it should be Alexander the Great we celebrate. And when I found out that the library in Alexandria was plundered by a Christian lynch mob in the fourth century, I had ammunition to go after Christianity here. So I'm the opposite of John Favarke. I celebrate Hellenism. And I celebrate Hellenism deeply in the sense that it's one of the few major cultural movements and political movements or religious movements throughout history that has connected East and West and also North and South. So today, when we live in an increasingly globalized world, we have to actually communicate peace with other cultures. And it's important to go back in history and see who figured this out before, who could at least temporarily have a period of peace that was prosperous. So what kind of models can we have to create a prosperous peace over long periods of time? Now, these structures are called empires and nations historically. And of course, the Persians did this first. They were then imitated by the Greeks. It's called Hellenism, et cetera, et cetera. So, so Alexander the Great is a great guy. Right? He conquered the world. He even made the Buddhists he made the Buddhists make statues in India. So whenever you see a Buddha statue, you should know it was the Greeks who taught the Indians how to make statues. There wasn't a single statue of Buddha before the Greeks arrived in India. Just an example of how great Hellenism is. But anyway, um, okay, we got three Alexanders here. We got a Trinity. So the idea is to have an Alexandrian Trinity that in the 2020s are kickstarting a project which is redoing metaphysics all the way through properly, right? And we have two fantastic smart asses um, out of London called Cox and Fraga who run Techno Social. So I can't think of any better group of five white heterosexual men or whatever we are who get together now in this space and do metaphysics properly. So what I wanted to do first is that I wanted to take our little Saint Jordan Peterson right here. Uh, Jordan is brilliant when he's doing clinical psychology and he's usually really good when he does Nietzsche and yoga, but he can be terrible at times. And I heard him in a conversation the other day, we talk about psychedelics and he got stuck in the sort of dualist idea that either everything is reduced to something material or it goes all the way up to this fantastic consciousness that apparently Jordan Peterson has. And, you know, Jordan Peterson says things like, 
I can't believe that because being would be absolutely meaningless if there wasn't consciousness. And all you think when you hear him say that is that I wonder if he's interviewed about half a million sperms who didn't make it to the egg when, you know, he came into existence because only one of the sperms made it to the egg. So all the other sperms apparently never got conscious and they were perfectly happy anyway. So we obviously live in a universe drenched in oceans of potentialities that never materialize, that never are never actualized. And if you can't understand that as a basic premise for metaphysics, which Jordan Peterson apparently can't, then you don't get it. And um, why reduce the world to either material or immaterial to begin with? It, because once you've acknowledged difference, you might as well have as many differences as you like. You may have an enormous amount of differences in the universe. And these differences might even turn out to be emergences, like something happens all of a sudden, in history that radically changes the game forever. And out of that emergence is an emergence vector. For example, biology suddenly occurs at least on one planet in the universe. And, and out of, uh, uh, on this planet, we have biology and the biology conquered the entire planet more or less. And we have life forms everywhere. We have plants and we have animals and eventually we have humans. And, and of course this biology starts emergence of biology and then you have an emergence vector called biology itself, which you can study as its own emergence vector. So either you have today, to say like Marcus Gabriel, the German philosopher says, either the world does not exist. There's nothing that actually connects the different things in the universe in any meaningful way. Or you can just say, for example, that actually everything is connected with everything else because it just happens to be that way. It's not like there was a law prior to the universe that said it would have to be that way. But as far as we know, maybe out of black holes or something, but nothing really has taken off anywhere. So everything is relating to everything else. So if an emergence occurs, all the previous emergence vectors in this universe will then, will then have an effect on that emergence and on that emergence vector. So once you start looking at the world as these emergences and you have emergence vectors and you develop emergence vector theory, you discover there's really no point in saying that one emergence vector is higher or lower than any other, you know? If you don't have a creator God, they're just different emergence vectors. A so mind can be studied on its own merit, biology on its own merit, physics on its own merit, chemistry on its own merit, culture on its own merit, whatever you like. But you can study these different emergence vectors in a sort of neutral manner in between them. And I think that is a much better foundation of a metaphysics than any sort of stupid reduction to any dualism or any consciousness. Hmm. So how's that for a start? Elong and I worked a lot on this. Maybe Elong want to pass on and take over from here. We also have some really interesting disagreements between us, Elong and I. Yeah, we do. Uh, and I think uh, me and Bart both started uh, emergence theory with the wish uh, to avoid reductions of all sorts and reductionism in general. And I think uh, Bart was touching on that when he, when he spoke about like the, the dichotomy between uh, materialism or dualism. And in some sense, there is a tendency to box up reality uh, into neat little um, vectors of attributes where when you, when you go and look at things, you're, you're looking at a much larger scope uh, of emergence. So we have some, we have some we, like me and Bart have worked on like, like a big history where we, in some sense, begin at, at subphysics, going to physics, then chemistry, biology, and then we realize that all these vectors have radically uh, different attributes. And then from biology, we go into mind. And in some sense, when we talk about ontology, um, which is how we understand the ontic, how we understand the real, the reality, um, then we begin with mind because we have to frame it in some sort of understanding. Um, so in some sense, we have to realize that, that, a lot of, that a lot of the things we're doing in emergence uh, vector theory also is a form of sense-making of something which might not even be um, like comprehensible in, in the first place. Like we might not even be able to comprehend it. So we have a limitation there. Um, what we are then trying to do is not limiting that comprehension into reduction. So we're not saying that, well, everything is matter and, and uh, the different attributes of mind are really just a, an, an expression of matter. It's an illusion, which materialists would say. And we're not really saying, well, mind and matter are, are so radically different that the only differences that really are in the universe 
rather we are looking at everything which exists and try to understand it uh, on its own merit in some sense. And then to facilitate that understanding, we are using some larger vectors uh, of emergent orders. So we say that, well, chemistry and physics are so radically different and biology is so radically different from chemistry that we should really engage with these fields in different ways uh, epistemologically. But the question is then, how do we frame this within a system which is, which is coherent? So we should be able to talk across these systems. And one of the ways, uh, and I would argue probably the only way to talk across these systems is using relationalism uh, as a general principle of what it means for something to exist. So if, if something doesn't relate, then, there, then it can have no attributes. So like if there's no, if there's no gravity, uh, then there's no weight. If there's no timeliness or sequences of time, then there's no time. Uh, even though uh, me and Bart then have uh, some semantic disagreements here regarding uh, time in particular and, and hyper time, which is the time before time itself or the time before, let's say, um, time as an actual occurrence. So when we talk about things that exist, we are talking about actual occurrences. And actual occurrences are a Whiteheadian concept. Alfred North Whitehead um, is, of course, a very, very famous philosopher and physicist uh, who, who began this whole idea. Um, or, well, not actually because there were, were relationists before him, but he was the first one to really merge like this uh, Hegelian dialectical idea with physics and try to explain the entirety of being uh, through these relations. So that's basically uh, the project that we are working on. I would say the tempting thing here is that as humans, we very quickly jump to general theory. So yeah. as soon as you have several different emergences and emergence vectors and you start studying them, you immediately want to find what they share and what they have in common. And here is why I'm radically Hegelian. I'd love to hear Ebert's point of this one too, but I'm radically Hegelian in the sense that necessity is only something human beings construct in hindsight, but the future is always contingent to us. So I would argue that to have a, a credible emergence vector theory, and this is where we differ, for example, Adrian Johnston and Terence Deacon and mm. other guys who've done really great work on emergence theory and philosophy in the last 20 years. We sort of throw them out. We, we say Deacon and Johnston are both wrong because they're too eager to find a general emergence theory. But once you have mm. a general emergence theory, that's also a theory for forthcoming emergences. And then you reinstall the creator God and you've installed rules and regulations for how creation must occur. And, and that is what we want to disqualify here. We want to say there is no general emergence theory. Rather, if a new emergence occurs in history, mm. to rewrite all of history, because we will have to review emergence as mm. I We'll have to review the concept of emergence vector because a new mm. emergence will, will make us look differently at what an emergence mm. is. And that is the only properly Hegelian approach you could take to these ideas. Yeah, it should also be said here that, uh, that Adrian Johnston is, is a materia uh, materialist. Maybe, like he, he's an advanced form of materialist. Yeah, he, he, calls his, he calls his philosophy transcendental materialism. Yeah. And, we, and, and Slava Shishi calls his philosophy dialectical materialism. Mm. We've thrown out materia, period, out the window. Emergence is prior to materia. And, and therefore, yeah. we call our philosophy transcendental emergentism. And I think this is an important point as well, because when you start with materialism, you start with substance, where as we pretty much um, turn it the other way around and say that, well, relation is actually uh, in some sense more fundamental than the substance itself. So we, if you start with the substance, then reality consists of these like neat Lego blocks. And the problem is then, well, how does anything new actually emerge? Because in, in some sense, it's all Lego blocks. But the, the, the thing you can do if you start with relation is have things that are radically different from each other. So the Lego block itself is, is not what builds the relation, it emerges out of the relation and then all the different attributes are just different features of different complexities of relation. So we don't have the same problem. And that, and that like Lego building block is what creates the hard problem. 
when you go into proper emergence theory, the heart problem dissipates immediately. So I, I, I love, I'd love to see Frog on this one as well. I'd love to bring in Ebert in the conversation. Mm. But uh, the, the irony here is that we tie Hegel and Deleuze together. Yeah, <laughs> so this is where actually Deleuze was crappy at reading Hegel properly. And actually there's much more Hegelianism in Deleuze than you would think. But Deleuze is the European whitehead. So the two mm. prophets in the 20th century of relationalism are whitehead and Deleuze. Mm. Different, different intensities of relation and the, 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 the different intensity is as they shift, they perhaps make certain uh, emergence vectors appear, but then you throw in another intensity, another emergence vector, and then you have to rewrite the whole system because it's all this mad system of becoming. You can't really articulate it in, a, in these boxes and then claim that they may relate to each other. Uh, uh, the word rhizome comes to mind. But... Mm. How are different emergence vectors relating to each other then? Um, let, me, let, me, let me step in real quick and, and just add. So now I understand what I'm going to be, <coughs> contra where I'm going to be contradicting you, or where there's an interesting first point of contradiction. To me, everything is substance. And all of the non-substantial things that we're considering are actually features of substance. And to me the true hard problem is created by disembodying substance from non-substance. Um, once we remove potential or potentia from the substance itself, once it operates in independently from substance, we're fucked. Because then you actually do need God, in my opinion. Then you actually do need a creator. And I just don't see why the aversion to the, if, if, if we're willing to believe in sort of the magical properties of nothingness, why not imbibe those magical properties into substance itself and then operate without a dualist structure? Well, why did you say magical properties or nothingness? We don't talk about nothingness anywhere in our philosophy. I mean, I'm being, I'm being pejorative. I mean, so uh, I'm assuming that, for instance, when we talk about potentia, or when you talk about, uh, Ilan, when you just mentioned that, that if we focus on substance, we cannot uh, apprehend the laws that, uh, that undergird substances behavior or emergence vector behavior, right? That there's something yeah. that is non-substantial that can aggregate and or create this sort of, this, this strata of potential. Where are the right? laws, where, 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 where are these laws coming from? I don't acknowledge, I'm Charles Saunders Peirce here. I don't acknowledge any laws before an emergence occurs. So before an emergence, there can be habits and those habits at the moment of emergence can then become laws within that emergence vector. So for example, the laws of biology can only occur after an emergence of biology. And it happens to be the habits in the previous emergence vectors that affect the laws that then become the laws of biology. Therefore, you can explain, for example, why the laws of physics or the laws of biology seem to be so weird, but they work, right? So the, the, uh, there are no laws prior to anything here. There is, there, is no, there is no such prior thing. We don't acknowledge that in, in this philosophy. Can I interject? Okay, okay. so when, when you talk, let me ask you a question, Edward. So when you talk about substance, are you, are you familiar with the concept prima materia? Sorry? P prima materia, it means like the first matter or, or the essence yeah, of yeah, the matter. Sure. Yeah. yeah, so when we talk about substance, do you, uh, if you say that substance is primary, do you have an idea of what prima materia could be? And it's fine. Like, it's not that anybody has successfully defined what the fuck energy is, but yeah, yeah. like, do you have an idea of what prima materia yeah. prim substance to, is in this case? To me, it's literally the substance of dialectic. It's simply the okay. substance of uh, emergence. So okay. you just have a, mu a mutational substance that's able yeah. to mutate uh, based yeah. on different configurations. So when you say that the substance is dialectics, then I think we are coming closer to each other again, because then you're also saying that the fundamental thing which being is, is relation. Because the other way around is saying that, and that this is the argument of, of uh, what Leibniz and Spinoza called monads. And it, that is the idea of these 
uh, like prima materia uh, atoms, uh, not atoms yeah. in, in the sense of modern physics, but atoms in the sense of these undividable uh, structures which reality is is based upon. Yeah. But if you say World that stuff. that the, yeah. okay, if you say that your idea of of substance is dialectical, then we are saying that well, for anything for, to exist. Uh, it must exist in a relation, so that's that's different from a substance first ontology, as, as it would be normally uh, classified. I guess I guess what I'm heading, what, what, where I skipped over to is is our is our disagreement about relation. I guess is where that's where I'm probably yeah. actually headed, um, okay. because I agree all existence is relational. So why yeah. non relata? So, but I'm skipping ahead, probably. Okay, so let's play here then. <laughs> Uh, let's yeah. bring up some new terms that we need for this. One of them is subphysics. And of course, there's been a revolution in physics, philosophically speaking, over the last 20 years. So we got guys like Roger Penrose and Lee Smallin and Leonard Susskind and other really brilliant physicists who realized the superstring theory was a dead end. It was background dependent. It didn't get anywhere. And they had to take a philosophical, metaphysical approach. So they started calling philosophers. For example, Smallin has written fantastic books together with Robert Mangabera Unger. And of course, philosophers like us that interested in, in the natural sciences, then reach out from the other end. So there's an interesting dialogue that has started here. So for example, why would you use the term subphysics? Well, there's so many things that are occurring in physics that we cannot explain with the current models, the standard model of physics as we have. One of the famous ones, of course, entanglement. And entanglement seems to operate in a kind of world where space-time as we know it is actually quite irrelevant for the entanglement itself. Mm-hmm. And this is why it gets interesting to either, as always, pick either time or space as primary here before you start studying these things. Einstein famously picked space, had three spatial dimensions, and added the fourth one that he called time, and it therefore constructed space-time. Space-time is undeniably a fantastic foundation for natural sciences, undoubtedly so. But if you make time prior to space, you could allow yourself, which Penrose does, Smallin does, mm-hmm. I certainly do with Sotokos, you can allow yourself the idea that there can be another time that isn't necessarily the sort of time you experience with space time. I would even then say, if you play around with this, that rather than seeing space time, which we know from physics as the primary relation, the first relation, the kicks off relation, also, we could say that the relation between hyper time and space time could be considered a primary relation. Then we get a whole new emergence vector prior or outside of physics. And that's the one that we call subphysics. And we're basically now opening up a playing field for physicists, natural scientists, and biologists also, complexity theorists and philosophers together to start playing around and said, maybe we should actually redefine physics because it got so messy. Just like we often separate physics and chemistry, it could make sense to separate physics and subphysics. Mm. And what then Absolutely. gets really interesting here for us, philosophically speaking, and this, is, this allows us something that Elon came up with and taught me a couple of years ago, was the idea that we can have potentia that have not yet gone into relations. There can be something prior, if you allow that, to relations themselves. They're not relata. Relata is the byproduct of relations. Mm. But prior to relations, there's potential that have not been yet been realized in any meaningful way. And these are what we call subsistence rather than existence. We only acknowledge existence within relationalism, and that's where I think we all agree. But prior to that, there's the potential for subsistence. And that gets interesting for physicists. For example, when they work with field theory. Because suddenly there's we know that there's a certain field. The muon is the latest one. Before that was the Higgs boson. Mm. But basically, these particles are fields. And these fields seem to be completely universal anywhere where any of the other emergence vectors are in effect. We, we find these fields everywhere. But they do not occur. They do not actualize themselves unless they go into some kind of collision or they become actualized through relation. And that, I think, is a really fruitful, creative way to work both in metaphysics and natural sciences as we progress forward. And another one, we also then kill the idea that physics is first science, which I love. Let me, let me ask you a couple of questions. Um, that was great, by the way. I love listening to that. Um, uh, okay, so back to entanglement, because entanglement really, if we could pick a problem that this argument sort of is necessitated by, it would sort of be entanglement. That's the thing that we are like, what the fuck, right? Um, 
the, the what the fuck problem of entanglement is, uh, you know, uh, Bell's inequality. It's, it's that either locality, speed of light, uh, is wrong, that things can't move faster than speed of light, or um, uh, what's the other thing? Um, oh, or there's hidden variables. So, so I guess my question to you is, with regard to your hypertime and your potentia, is that, okay, so, so first things first, you said, okay, space-time is irrelevant. We have to throw that away because of entanglement tells us something about relationality prevents lo- uh, locality. It prevents, uh, uh, you know, uh, faster than speed of light communication through space-time. So somehow there has to be a subsisting order. So Einstein and them had this idea of hidden, hidden variables that were essentially like these these hidden entanglements, sort of like a potential, the way I, I interpret it, I wonder if you do. So is, is essentially the potential, the hidden variables, and is hypertime your faster than speed of light? What is no, hypertime? No, 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 no. You got to understand that there is definitely a world outside of space time. So space time occurs after the Big Bang or the Big Bounce, okay? It, there was no space time prior to that. Not, not the space time we know today. We know that it started afterwards. So there is something if, prior to space time. But wait a second. The, the, there's no hidden variables here. And Einstein tried to save space time as first science. That's what he tried to do, admirably so. Then David Bohm came along, and David Bohm turned hidden variables into pilot wave theory. And what it did fantastically in the 1950s, uniquely, was that it made a model where everything we knew from the standard model of physics would make sense, except we never found the pilot waves. They weren't there. So that's, again, like super theory. You've you got to give up to, at a certain point. But yeah, it looked fantastic. But the explanation must be deeper than that. And what I then suggest is that entanglement occurs within a hypertemporal world where space-time does not exist. But we cannot time travel or anything like that at all. We cannot jump out of space-time into hypertime because decoherence will make everything fall apart instantly if you try to leave space-time. We are very, 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 very stuck within space-time. And our human world is stuck there. And, and the emergence vectors that we know well, like biology and mind and everything, are definitely space-temporal. But we now acknowledge that there are phenomena, undeniable phenomena occurring like entanglement, that operate in a hypertemporal world where space-time does not exist. Mm. So, this is, the, so th- this is where I don't understand. So to me, there's only space. Right. Basically, everything is I I could go so far as just be like everything is space. And what you're describing is a feature of space. I don't understand why we have to get rid of space because and and this gets back to the substance, no substance thing. And and I love you for it because this is so Spinoza Einstein. You you could be Spinoza and Einstein's defender. The problem is this. If you got to sacrifice either space or time and think through it properly you will sacrifice space. You can consider time without space, but you cannot consider space without time. It's Why absolutely not? impossible to That's think. That's my whole compression thing. The whole idea of compression is space without time. Okay, it's you totally got, okay. People, don't, people who are not on the Twitter Depot do not know your fantastic compression concept. So please present your compression concept. The stage is yours. <laughs> Here we go, compression. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it's yours. Okay, fine. Go ahead. Okay. So in a nutshell, just to, I'll, I'll tell it in reverse. So where I just ended with you is that you can have space without time. The idea is that with enough compression, you lose relation and relation is time. Rel- time is, is determined by intervals. Without intervals, you have no time. You need an interval. It doesn't matter what that interval is. If you do not have intervals, you have no time. Effectively. So why are you shaking? Your, I got because move you're, ta- I you're talking space agree. time all the time. You're stuck with space time. <laughs> you haven't here, thought. You haven't thought hyper time. You haven't thought hyper time. It's a very different. No, but we have to understand that hyper time is a, is a different concept from space time temporality. Yes. So we have to we have to set because I have I like it, it has taken me a long time <laughs> to understand what Bart means when he says hyper time because I I used to call it the non temporal order and I was actually so I understand what you're saying here, but but I think there's just a semantic unfolding that we have to do first. Yeah, so my critique of White here, White says at right. temporal order, he gives a tempo for that at temporal order to exist along. There's always a time axis. Every time somebody thinks they have to institute some kind of a time axis, that is not just the discrete movement of things within a space time expansion. 
Because space-time operates the way it does. You're absolutely right, David. We know how space-time operates. We know more about it. Loop quantum we gravity. Know. We don't know shit covering about our, space-time. No, loop we quantum gravity. Is getting, loop quantum gravity is getting to space-time now. Okay. It is the next big revolution so, in physics, and that's fantastic. But what I'm talking about here is what increasingly these very physicists are now getting interested in is that because the, the space-time has a background of some kind, it's kind of eerie, an entanglement of these phenomena that now pop up and undeniably are true, it, they can only be explained by adding a high temporal axis. I can get to Penrose's mm. version of it later, but I want to stay with this topic now. But let's go to Penrose later because his take on the space okay. time is just amazing. So no, normally when one talks about time, we would equate it with the concept endurance. And normally when we talk about space, we would equate that with extension. So when we look at something like endurance, so when, if we take Whitehead, for instance, his concept of reality is based on these actual events. But the important thing to understand about these actual events is that they don't endure in time. They are immediately, as they happen, they disappear again. So we are talking about something which doesn't necessarily exist in time yet. It is the relation between them which creates the endurance. The Whitehead calls it a society of events because they are stringed together like pearls. So when, you when know, we what then you just described, just to interject, what you just described is the way the Higgs boson is 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 described, the Higgs field. That that, that the okay. So yeah. that's that's substance. I'm just just making sure we're still in the world of substance. Um, well, well, in some sense we are, but, but I think our, our difference is that I, I would argue that substance is a byproduct of the relation and not the relation itself. And the, reason, right. and the reason why I would argue that is if substance is primary, then what is the relation? So there must, like, if, if, if relation and relata are the same thing, then there's, there's no necessary difference for the relation. So to why have a relation... Both? Sorry? Why can't it be both? Why can't, why can't one inform the other? Because if everything is the same substance, where from do you get the difference which is necessary to create the relation? From, from uh, configurations, from different... Well, like when we what? talk about configurations, then you're talking about density, dif- differences in density. For there to be a difference in density, there must be something other than its substance itself. There must be a squeezing. That's not just the substance. That is something acting upon the substance. And what is acting upon the substance is the relation. So when you have anything which require a difference, the relation must be first. Because otherwise there can be no difference. Why is that problematic for you? Because if there is no difference, then there's no being. Because you're cheating, Ibert. <laughs> you, you haven't defined how <laughs> substance become different. How does substance become difference? How, does no. the, how is there any difference to the substance? Because the substance is just your substance. Actually, exactly. I'm going to say one nice no thing about it. One good thing about it. Well, there is, there is there definitely a difference. Your substance that you're talking about might end up being the hyper time that I'm talking about. But except of thinking it spatially, you think it temporally, you can get into a really interesting place. But I prefer to use the word subsistence and existence. And I rarely talk about substance because we fall back into the Spinozist Einstein trap. We use that term. I talk about substance versus subject later. We talk with Hegel. But I prefer to use the term subsistence here and existence to make a difference hmm. between something that is a potential that has not actualized in any form whatsoever, but therefore can when it collides, it's called membrane theory in natural sciences. When it collides with something, suddenly it's a relation and something occurs. And this was even, this was even in superstring theory which had written in the 1990s. This was he, how they assumed the Big Bang would occur. It yeah. would be membranes so is, that would just be potential that would collide and because they would collide, a Big Bang could occur. And that is how they started creating M theory out of superstring theory when at least superstring theory matured and started making sense. Edward Wicked is a fucking genius. But I think he was, he was making it the wrong way because he was t- thinking too much spatially, not enough temporally. And I think eventually in the sort of dialogue that I imagine between Penrose and Wicked, we would arrive at what mm. Penrose's cycles of time as a better place to start to do what I call membrane theory next. Yeah. So just to finish off the point, if, if substance and difference are essentially the same thing, then there is no difference. Do, do, like, do you understand that? 
Oh, there is no please, and please there respond. Is no please respond to. No, they, please they, respond they, to it as well, Ebert. Because there I want to no understand. Sub, there's no substance if there's only difference. The thing is that the relations have to be in some kind of a container to make sense, and we call that a world. And either you argue there is no world, or, 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 or everything is just split, like Marcus Garbel says. I would say. Yeah. I am with you, El- Elung, and you, you came with this term. It's another one of your beautiful terms. It's neutral monism. And neutral hmm. monism is basically that we happen to live in a universe that as far as we know is modest, meaning there's hmm. only one substance to it. And this substance is substance where everything affects everything else. And it's, of course, like been also said, full of an, an enormous amount of different differences, enormous amounts of attributes. And those are really what constitutes the, sub- the substance. The substance is not like some flat space or whatever, but rather it is the difference that constitutes the universe. We know as far as we know, you, the universe could be constructed otherwise, and it could darn, turn out, for example, that black holes really do kickstart other universes that we didn't lose contact with completely. So then we live in dualist and trialist and whatever universes. But as far as we know right now, we have no evidence mm. whatsoever that there's any other universe than the one we've known since the Big Bounce 14 billion years ago. Yeah. That's why I'm a neutral modest. Well, I think uh, I agree with you, of course. I think the problem with using substance is that how do you like how do you weigh a dream for instance like we run into these problems <laughs> of these different emergences being yeah. so radically different okay that, well, let, me ask, we, let me ask you a question okay. is the dream is the dream so there's a multitude of dreams is the dream always uh, related to a dreamer and i guess just to phrase that more directly is subsistence always tethered not every subsistence <clears> but is does is subsistence does the implicate always have like uh, an explicate is subsistence. No, 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 no. Not, 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 no. To, not to my because there's there's an like an enormous amount of unrealized potentials. Sure, sure. But is one so, of those. So what we are seeing is a, at any okay, Ebert, I will put it this way, frame it this way. Once we really start getting into subphysics and recognize it as a natural or a cultural science, if you like, we will probably discover that there are an enormous amounts of fields that just have mm. no effect on us. Yeah, no I mean, just, just to just And therefore, they do like, not go um, into relations that are meaningful from a human or subjective point of view of describing the universe as we know it. Like, so it doesn't like, make any sense about our physics to talk about this field. But I would expect that <clears> there are a lot of pot- fields of potentials out there that just don't have any correlation to anything that's meaningful. Sure, oh. sure, well, sure. Super oh, so let me just, like, a, like a five-year-old, though. Let, uh, let me just get the, the, the basic, basic question out there. Does... Do you, when you guys think of potential, can you think of it as you say? So I'm just making sure you mean what you say. That it that space time that there's something that pre-existed space time, and that's this field that you're referring to. That's this subsistence actually can exist without it. Because in your emails, you've said yes as a describer, but then no operationally. And I just want to understand. Because I, I'm, I'm more concerned with operation. I find that a little more interesting. So that's why I'm always on about relation. And when you guys are describing it, why describe it as pre-existing? And if you do think of it as pre-existing, why not think of that pre-existence itself as either ontic or, or demonstrable, at least in a, in a thought experiment? Oh, it could very well be, and it could be very well be, and sub, because subphysics is becoming a natural science. It, it makes sense not to spin off some of the things of physics, you're t- testing of physics, and think of them as subphysics. We already used the idea that we separate classical physics and quantum physics, but I don't want to make those two emergence vectors, because I think decoherence and coherence actually explain the only difference that really is between quantum physics and classical physics. But for example, when you cannot unify gravity today, with quantum theory, it's probably because you're actually talking about two different emergence vectors. So for me, the impossibility of unifying gravity with quantum theory is exactly the same sort of hard problem that trying to unify mind and matter. It doesn't make any sense. You're talking about two, two totally different things that do not even directly relate to one another. I think there's a better way of looking at it. And that opens up for a field of subphysics. But I, I want to, I'm going to give you an example of Roger Penrose thinking here, since it's so far out. This is a genius, at least on a par with Einstein. And he has invented mathematics. New forms of mathematics are just fantastic, like crystal theories. If you go into mathematics, Penrose is an absolute genius, right? He's also a sweet and kind guy, uniquely so. But anyway, with cycles of time, he started thinking in a whole new way, like, you know, if the big bounce happened and 
Bolgerwald's equation in 2011, read Matthias Bolgerwald, young German genius, right? Uh, he showed that if you removed infinity signs and zeros out of the mathematics, which I've long argued in physics, then you could actually think of the Big Bang as not a Big Bang at all. And Lawrence Krauss and these guys are out the window. Actually, and this is where your ideas are but with compression get interesting. Actually, Bolgerwald assumed that a previous universe imploded, but it stopped at the Planck length because it must stop at the Planck length. There's some, some kind of meta law there. And because it stopped the Planck length with the enormous density that a universe pressured into, compressed into the Planck length would be. That then became the expansion of the current universe and a certain new space time with the laws that we know in nature now then occurred. So there's a hyper time here needed for Bolgerwald to connect the previous and the new universe. That's why hyper time is needed. And then Penrose started thinking about these ideas and said, but wait a second, we then assume that the universe will expand and expand and expand. And we know it's fiendishly hard to think that it will expand forever because there has to be something that then collapses. And we don't know any laws of nature that actually would do that. But we know that the universe, we know it now, will probably expand forever and ever and ever and ever for, you know, for hundreds of millions of billions of years or whatever. And then finally, it will be dissolved into nothing but photons. Wait, that's interesting. So if you think of a massive space time, with only photons in it, all mass will be gone by then. And if mass is gone, if there's no mass any longer, that means the Higgs field becomes completely irrelevant. And that means it can start again without imploding. Mm. This is Penrose's radical idea that I love because it ties it, of course, in my ideas, but also because the guy is so smart. Mathematics looks good. Penrose says, let's, let's thread carefully here now because, you know, it's one theory among many, but at least now we could think of the universe as cyclical, but not cyclical in the way that it expands and implodes and expands and implodes. Rather, it expands until the expansion itself of space-time means nothing. And then it just restarts. And let's see what we get now, because Penrose argues forcefully that, that should, we should be able to prove that when we start looking at the big bang, big bounce. And one of the signs that we've solved ugly problems in physics, if this turns out to be true, is that inflation theory will be out the window. Because the patterns that, that we interpret as inflation in, cost, in the cosmic background radiation, really is something that happened just prior to the first expansion of space-time in the current universe as we know it. It's an incredibly attractive idea. And I think Penrose has got everybody's ears right now because I, I don't know anybody out there is even remotely as close to making a major breakthrough. And this is where I think he needs from us as philosophers, he needs the category of subphysics, a separate physics. He needs hyper-time, a separate from space-time. He needs... Uh, existentia is separate from substantia. He needs, he needs these, these vocabularies to be able to play with these things so we can have a subphysics and a physics category. And the subphysics of the hypertime is here to connect the two universes. So it's required. Let me, so let me jump in with, with where I feel like, like you, as you pointed out, where compression can actually help uh, maybe the, in, in, a, in a slight agreement. And then I'd like to try and uh, expand that, that, that theory into yours and see if you'll accept it. But very briefly, so this idea of, um, you know, I sent you a, a photograph of um, essentially, you know, if you know what a, a toroidal field is, um, it's like a donut that's very tight at the center and the waves kind of come in and then go around. And so, you know, it's like an apple and with the waves going through the core and then around its surface. Um, anyway, in essence, that, that uh, tunnel, uh, for lack of a better word, compresses the information that comes through it. The waves that come through it get compressed and then come out again. If you imagine a bunch of those little donuts in the universe drawing energy in while, let's say, dark energy is expanding the universe or whatever we say is creating the expansion, you end up with the simultaneously, uh, which has been essentially aver uh, observed, constriction of local universe or local, local world vis-a-vis -vis gravity, et cetera, and then expansion. And if you think of these sort of the energy going in, the compressing energy going in, then contributing to a constant, let's say a universal constant of expansion, it would then sort of, you know, create a, a more rapid expansion, which we see as acceleration. But you're saying acceleration and inflation are the same thing, no? No, no. Inflation is the idea 
that at very, very early stage, very, very shortly after the universe oh, started oh, existing, sorry, yeah, yeah. Course, there was a massive course. expansion way beyond the speed of light yeah, yeah, yeah. that then could explain all the weird patterns we find in the cosmic background radiation. Yeah. What we do now is by introducing hyper-time and subphysics, we say, no, actually, uh, things can happen prior to space-time expansion. And that would then be patterns in the space-time expansion. And that would explain okay. inflation. So, Penrose is now a huge fan of this. He's, he's going, what he says, he's going after the ugly inflation theory to finally get it out. Because it was always an ugly thing that probably wasn't meant to stay within physics anyway. Right. And I, yeah. Okay, so that, so that compression that, compression that happens in, in my world, when so back to this idea of timeless form that I think nicely sort of like superimposes over your sense of hyper time. Of course, it's in a discrete packet of compression. So as opposed to sort of a universalized function yet, now I'm describing it just as operating within a discrete packet of compression. So a Planck length star, whatever you have that's before information evaporates. And that compression um, creates total relata where differential elements become so glommed that they are in, you know, they're disformed, they're in a state of disformation. And when you have, you know, that glom, uh, time stops in my worldview, because time is about interval. And it- Space sort of time stops, hyper time pushes on. Sure, yeah. right, exactly. The space exactly. time stops, so yes, absolutely. What almost I begins, what, what begins at total relata is hyper time. Hypertime is, is, is a necessary, um, it's, the, it's the describer of this state of total relata, compression. Because there is no time, you have hypertime. Everything is related at once at the same time. Uh, think of it like the, the, the universe's most mm. intense zip, uh, zip uh, you know, compression. File. Zip file. <laughs> zip file. Um, okay, so anyway, so you have that. And what that does is create the hidden variables that Einstein is talking about. So in the state of total relata of hyper time, everything grows an affinity for one another. You could say everything gets pre-entangled, a pre-tanglement that creates the hidden variables that then would describe why things like Bell's inequality are being observed. Mm -hmm. So that entanglement is something that's baked into uh, all substance in this hypertemporal state. And so that when it uh, expands, hypertime expands with it and becomes sort of a feature of it. So it's not that I see substance as primary, but it's the easiest way to think about hypertime for me because it's about the expansion and contraction and compression of substance into total relata and then relata again. But hypertime is invented there. Uh, it's the describer of it. It is the state. And then it goes along for the ride uh, as a feature, a pre-entangled, think of it like friend, like Wolfram will describe these differential elements as uh, a friendship networks, uh, you know, that are actually creating space. And that's basically what I'm talking about. In that state of total relata, you end up with uh, a pre-entanglement that then subsists. I would say, yeah, it, it's great that you discover areas where hypertime is useful, but because the, the problems of things like hypertime is, for example, that this must be, this must exist all the time all the time, literally, on, so space-time operates on top of hyper-time. That also means it has to be the same everywhere in the universe. And number one, because it's not relating to space at all, it can be the same everywhere in the universe. So for example, entangled objects can be light years apart and still behave simultaneously exactly the same way, like two twins in a bathtub. So, but that means also if you would measure hyper-time, which I would say is number one impossible according to Penrose, because measuring time needs a clock and a clock has mass and therefore it cannot be measured. But if you mm. would think of hypertime, you, you would allow yourself to think that hypertime could be measured. For example, we say the universe is 40 billion years old. When then we're assuming hypertime, we say that. We assume a sort of measured average time for the universe as a whole. So I would argue that if you're going to measure hypertime and have a clock to measure it while it's happening, you would use the entire universe as the clock. The entire universe is the reflection of hypertime is the manifestation of the implicit and manifested hidden variables that it, of the differences. It's like this universal alchemical object of, of um, the Philosopher's Stone. It is transmutation itself. And then no, it no, 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 yeah, yeah. Okay, you talk about the hypertime space-time relation, yes, but hypertime can exist without space-time. We must be adamant here that it can. Mm -hmm. And in that case, it's just an unrealized potential, like the sperms who did not become Jordan Peterson. Like, the 
The world is full of potential that never occurs. We got to start there. So hyper time in itself is in itself nothing but a potential. And the fact that it did occur is where Elung's idea of relationalism comes in here. The fact that something did occur, something did occur. We, we could start with the Big Bang, if you like that. You could start with any emergence. Something did occur. And the fact that things do occur and new emergence vectors come out of that, that are relational, totally relational, all the way through relational. The fact that that occurs is just a fact. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm a kind of a fan here of, you know, from Leibniz to Heidegger, there's the famous saying that philosophy starts with why is there something rather than nothing? And the clever little French bastard, Henri Bergson, he, he just rethought that and said, isn't that a boring question? He's just like, why would, why would I wake up in the morning and want to be a philosopher and ask that question? When nothing, I don't find nothing anywhere. Nothing in infinity are things that do not exist anywhere. They're, they're sort of vague, abstract concepts, but since we can't describe them, they obviously do not exist. So well, why don't I just say, the, the interesting question for philosophy, according to Bergson, and Deleuze loves this quote, is that why is there so much of everything? Hmm. And that to me is the fundamental metaphysical question. Then Why how is you- there so much of difference within the substance we're talking about? Instead of focusing on Spinoza's substance, I focus on the enormous amounts of attributes. And these attributes, they look enormous, they look at the actualities, but when they start looking at the potentialities that never occur, wow. Hmm. So why do you get it like a Hegelian describe- negation? Sorry, just- Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. No, I'm thinking a Hegelian idea of negation because there's that thing that Zizek says, right? He turns that question on its head in a different way. He's like, why is there nothing rather than something? The point being that when you're thinking from a Hegelian metaphysics, you're always looking for like the non-whole universality. There's always some kind of emptiness that allows for the next emergence. Yeah, but then he goes into less than nothing, mm-hmm. the best book he wrote, by the way, and he made Slavo a great philosopher. But the problem is that he doesn't talk about nothing either. He talks about negation literally here. Hmm. So, so, so negation, ne- neg- negation, negation, what I'm working with, and you, I'm, all of you guys out there, including you for brilliant minds here, but all of you out there can help me. I want to match the negation. Oh, Cattle Last is really hot on Hegel and the Lacanian Shishikian version. He's like, he's like Shishik's bastard son who came out of Canada, working class guy. And, you know, so I must be shocked because I honestly think that Cattle recommended it. Cattle Last's lessons on less than nothing on YouTube are even better than the book. That's how good cattle is, right? But anyway, but I would say that I want to match the idea of negation. It is important, and we can go further if you like with that Owen here, but I want to match that with the concept of oscillation. And I think oscillation relates to Ebert's fantastic concept of compression. And I want to, I want to work deeper with oscillation and I work more, 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 because at, at the minimum energy level, things are never fixed. Everything Fixation is, oscillation. is a human fantasy. Things are moving, 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 moving all the time. So they're oscillating. So oscillation and negation are work in both of those. And I think difference is generated both by negation and oscillation. Possibly as a dialectic relationship. Hmm. Oscillation is, is, is interval. I mean, you, oscillation is the sine wave wrapping hmm. around equilibrium. That's oscillation. It's life itself is oscillation, right? But I just, uh, bef- just before we move on and, and the world thinks I just agreed with you, I just want to let the world know I, I do not, uh, that uh, a very specific issue. Um, so when Fraga b- brought up, uh, oh yes, okay, so substance and then subsistence is underneath it and you corrected him, you're like, no, because everyone's focused on the actual and we're looking at the potential. So where the where those two visions merge for me is my worldview, which is that the let's say the substance, let's say the the person, um, yes, they have their relationship to the explicate, their actuality, but they have a web of total relata reaching out to everything else in the universe. Because at one point it was we were all in this compressed form, and so what Fraga said is correct, is that. Substance itself is not simply tied to ex- its expl- explicate, but of course tied to all of its implicates um, at all times. And so for me, that's why I always come back to substance as part of the tethering. One can be thought of as a feature of the other or vice versa, but none ever exists without the other. And so, yeah, I just wanted to put a mark on that. I, yeah. they, they do now, yeah, but I, I am adamant that there wasn't a law that said it had, would have to be that way. 
I'm very, very careful about applying any laws on my philosophy. And I learned this from Americans. I learned this in Charles Saunders' purse. American <laughs> Hegel. I mean, the point with Paris is that be very, very, very careful applying any laws, and especially laws that are prior to what you're studying. Where did no, they I'm come from? With that. I'm fine right? with that. So, yeah. so, so I talk about habits. And we should, we should just point out one more thing here for those who engage in this conversation. When we talk about implicate order, you, you can correct me if you don't agree with me, but my definition is that when we talk about implicate order, we talk about something prior to the emergence. So whatever led to the emergence itself, and I'm a transdeterminist, I'm neither determinist or indeterminist. Those are hmm. dichotomies I don't acknowledge. But I'm a transdeterminist. But, but the, the enormous complexity of something leads up to an emergence. And this is why we talk about implicate orders as that that happens before the emergence, before the relation occurs in this case. And then and after the murders, that's an explicate order. So when we use these terms explicate and implicate. Explicate is then tied to what's actual. Implicate is tied to what is potential, for example. So I hope you agree with me on that. Yeah, I think like Ebbets, the way Ebbets is describing compression is, is very, very close to, to David Bohm, where it is like, it is an actual, like the, David Bohm, this <clears throat> theory is that there is, there is an infolding, which is very close to what you call like a, the, the gigantic uh, zip file. So the universe started as a massive infolding, which is then unfolded through actuality or through existence. But I mean, the problem with that, which which Bart was was just touching on, is that it leads to extreme determinism. Yeah. Because being can be nothing then but an unfolding, which leads to two major problems: no creative advance, which means you can't really have emergence if everything is just an unfolding. Nothing really new can happen mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it's just it's just what was compressed. Sorry, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't at all. That's not how I view uh, uh, the unfolding in in my worldview. The, the unfolding in my worldview is um, is purely uh, contextual and purely dialectic. So that uh, it's all about new configurations that happen in space time and that's why i love this sp or space i'm not even gonna say space in space because in space um that's where these sort of relationships occur and when they occur in different configurations different things happen that are not deterministic but rather relational Transdeterminist is a fantastic word. You agree. We agree on this. Uh, so I, I want to get yeah. the whole boring dichotomy of determinism versus determinism. <laughs> it's one of those remnants of Judeo Christian thinking, Christian thinking. I want to get out of philosophy altogether. So let me just clarify. I radically propose transdeterminism as a term for just a massive complex happening. But it's precisely, if, 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 you, if you remove inflation theory, for example, and you say that whatever inflation theory is a pattern of, it's a pattern of something that occurred prior to the Big Bang or the Big Bounce. So within it, before mm. space time starts expanding. And then I agree with you, Ebert, on everything. Everything we talk about that's meaningful occurs in the space time wave. Everything that's mm -hmm. meaningful occurs in the space time wave. We just, we just put a category here that it's prior outside of it because it makes sure. more sense than for everything else. Sure, and but, my version but, of but, prior. But the chance, I wouldn't say chance because chance moves you back into determinism and determinism stuff. But the complexity that went the way it did and then we see the inflation patterns afterwards in physics in the current universe. Became, there were habits prior and after the merge became the laws that we know now as the laws of physics. And this necessitates the existence of potentials that did not manifest and with which we must infer. We must, we must assume they are there and leave it open-ended. That's it. Yes, exactly, Fraga. Brilliant. <laughs> Uh, uh, just touching on your word, uh, you know, wanting to get the, the words right for everyone. Um, I, I, I just listened as, as like very rushed homework to, to something you had done with Sweeney and, and uh, Ilan. And um, you mentioned something about what you just referred to, which is that your, your implicate is the preceding explicate uh, uh, pre-dialectical handover, uh, handoff, basically, right? It's, it's, Whatever, pre whatever emergence precedes an emergence sort of like subsists as its guiding implicate. Yeah, and here, well, that's, I that's should be both, careful. That's both uh, definition. I would, yeah, okay. Uh, I, I, be, I don't be, know who be, you be, are be, asking, be careful, but. do not apply general theories here that must be applicable for an emergence. But the emergence that we know of, let's talk about the ones we know about, okay? And the ones we know about, I think also Ellen agrees with, the ones we know about have some things in common. And then we can say without them being rules, 
the emergence of Duterte because a new, like Quentin Malassou says, what if God suddenly occurs, right? Then we have to change everything because if that happens, that changes everything. So, uh, but from the emergence we know of, we know certain things they have in common and the implicate order is what I then call habits, uh, habits of nature, or habits of culture like habits, that become yeah. laws of nature, laws of culture following the emergence itself. So we know, for example, that a certain complexity suddenly starts organizing where we get pretty fixed and suddenly it's fixed. And that is probably how emergences work. Deacon is into this, like suddenly there's a fixation, there's a certain coherence and the coherence means that certain things are fixed. And from that on, things will then operate within the fixation that just occurred. So in the emergence, there is a fixation and that is what I call the shift from habits of nature to laws of nature. And that becomes sure. the loss of that emergence vector. Following I that. love that word habits. I think for me, implicate is more what you guys refer to as potential. Implicate is the, is the total relata web that I you know, keep mentioning. Yeah, That's but here the- I remind you, you're an American and you must defend your heritage. And Charles Sanders <laughs> first is the American Hegel. And it was Charles Sanders first who said, there are no laws of nature, there are only habits of nature. And some of those habits tend to stay around for a bit longer in certain environments. And those are the ones that we as humans, because we love laws, we interpret them as laws of nature. It was very annoying. Yes, but I would just consider that sort of emergent redundancy or emergent overlap where you just have overlap of, of emergences. And so you have those guiding principles, but I wouldn't call that the X, the, the implicate um, to me. So we're just like, I'm flipping, I'm happy to flip my term over to you, but then what is the, what is the, is, are we just calling potentia potentia or is there another sort of, or, or a subsistence? Well, we have, or, we, we, yeah, we have to understand that these, these, these different concepts also uh, belong to different theories. So the implicate, the implicate order is, is Bob's terminology, and he's a physicist primarily. So, so he, he's like, it all comes from, so there's like Wheeler, Bob, Whitehead, and a bunch of others are dealing with the same problem, which is that how, how did the universe emerge in the first place? So, and, and the way that problem is usually solved, because think, like there's this, if something is coming from nothing, then how does it know how to relate in the first place? So, so, that must, so that's why we are talking about this substrata, substrata of something which doesn't actually exist as an actual occurrence, but subsists. Sure. So subsistence in this case is, is uh, just a concept that it doesn't extend uh, in space uh, and doesn't endure in temporality as, as a part of the space-time order. So the but I feel like order is. Yeah. No, I was just. I, I, I just feel like Bohm's is okay. Bohm's so the implicate, implicate order, though, his, his implicate order is more of what I'm talking about. His enfoldments are literally even memory things that have happened that return to the implicate. So not just things that are being informed, but things that are being recuperated into the implicate. But then also all of the potential uh, available to the explicate is enfolded in the implicate. So not simply the rules or laws or- Yeah, or but habits. that is because he's a determinist. That's exactly- Yeah, the way, the way I understand- So, so David, David Bohm, David Bohm there's firmly- nothing, there's, a there's, kind nothing of a inherently, yeah. there's nothing inherently deterministic about that. Yes, there is, because it, no, it's, it's all pre-programmed. It's all pre-programmed. No, there is Everybody. not, because different configurations would elicit different implicate orders to actuate. It's they're they're not it's not a predetermined unfoldment as far as I understand it at least not in my implicate but uh, but in Bohm's I I I mean you know I, I just I think, think I think Bohm is a self-admitted determinist I believe like he 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 is in he's, he's in the both feet with the well, I disagree I disagree with him there the whole idea of enfoldment uh, being completely deterministic makes no sense um, to me but an okay implicate so order, so let me ask you a question then where yeah. where if if there was an enfoldment where would the actual creative advance then come from? How do you get Where something entirely new? Okay, so if the, yeah. if the whole universe existed or persisted in an unfoldment, and what we are seeing as the observable universe is an unfoldment of that extremely intense compression, how does yeah. anything new come into existence? Yeah. From different configurations. So, yeah. so everything is just configurations. Everything is dialectics. Okay, everything but... but, but but if it's different configurations, like you have the primary colors, but you can't, you can't not invent a color that isn't on the spectrum of light, right? Because like, so, so if, you ha- if everything uh, of substance was extremely compressed, 
then all the configurations must have pre-existed. That is the concept of the implicate order. No, so the pre-existence. The, let me just no, finish the thought. Well, not necessarily. Because how, so so let me, okay. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Let, let's let's just add and finish here, and then you have a okay. But, no, because sorry. I'm also interested in what you have to say, but let me just finish the argument, which is that then all configurations must be a result of what it was was unfolded. So there, there can't come any new configuration. So like if you have no. okay, so let's say let's say you have a deck of cards, right? There now they are compressed in the deck. Then we spread them out. Different, different no, configurations okay, so can let happen. Me clarify. Let okay. me clarify. When total relata happens, when the compression yeah. happens, there are no more configurations. Total relata is every, it's one configuration, and that configuration is that everything is attached to everything else. That's the only I, I understand that. I understand and that. In the unfoldment, there's no return to configurations. There are only now new configurations. Um, okay improvised configurations based on relation. Yeah, and that, right. that's what- How does any new relation, let me just finish. Let me fill in. That's what Bohm beautifully calls the holoverse. So he, he mm -hmm. takes yeah. the holoverse movement from momenta to momenta to momenta, y to degrees. It's the only way to describe the world in a mm -hmm. meaningful way. I then add, with so do Christian- how is that deterministic? That we, no, no, but, but, no, okay, no, no, just, no, no, it's not. It. No, no, stop, stop. Let me finish, okay? Before you talk before that. No, it is not, because the, what unfolds from momenta to momenta is both operating on a hypertemporal axis and a spatial temporal axis, and it's precisely the oscillation between these two that makes sure that there is no determinism here. It is a trans-determinist universe precisely because we have hypertime. And hypertime is not space-time. And the oscillation between the two as first relation generates the other relations. And then we have an explanation for the other relations in the universe to begin with. That's the point. So, yeah, yeah. I, I understand what you're saying, Ebert. I think, I think the point is that if, like, if you have a compressed deck of cards and then we play a game, and let's say the universe is that game, then you can have different hands, you have different configurations of cards, but they are all based on the same deck. So, so that puts a limitation, and there is, of course, sure, that puts yes. a limitation on what is able to emerge. Sure. So I think, We're and, and the way... Oh, sorry? We're talking about non-infinity, so there's a limitation. Well, there's a difference between there's a difference between the limitations you get if everything comes from a deck and the limitations of not everything being actualized. I think there's a there's a very important difference between those those two. But I, and I'm not saying this is your theory, this is a critique of David Bump's implicate order. But the problem is that if you if you have if you believe that the universe consists of things that are inherently different then there must also be a possibility of radically, radical creative advance. So, so in the sense that the playing cards uh, doesn't come out from the, the stack and then come into being, it's the, it's the game itself which creates the cards. And I think yeah, that, that's and the- I, And I think the opening for that, agree. where where the creativity occurs is precisely what's called yeah. the function collapse. We need to develop that concept further, but Penrose into that too. So why don't you skip the pilot wave theory and said, okay, interesting from Bohm, but he got stuck with determinism and we couldn't really prove there weren't any pilot waves there. It's a creative God theory, but a brilliant one. Okay, but let's, let, let's put Bohm where he is and use his terminology wisely and, and redefine it if we have to. But what then we need to do is to look at the way a function collapse. And this to me is another really interesting relation. We call it the dialectics of eternalism and mobilism in our philosophy. It's all over the place in my Sotica's books. And what he essentially says that in, in existence itself, there has to be certain occurrences. And these occurrences happen according to probabilities, but they do happen. Not randomly, I want to say randomly, but transdeterministically, they do happen. And when they happen, they break. They make radical breaks. And these radical breaks are enabling freedom and creativity in the universe. And I think this is what, what Heide was getting at. And I think with Penrose, if you move from white to Penrose, you can actually see the pattern of that pattern of thought. And for Penrose, this is the only feasible option when we discuss fields and particles and their relations to one another and how you put relationalism into a proper field theory. 
So these fields, these fields, we talk about fields of potential in some physics and they become physics, they become relations. But also within physics and within biology, everywhere you go, you find fields, you find probabilities in different distributions, but only occurrences are very small. Again, only one of, sper only one of the sperms hit the egg in Jordan Peterson was created and, and half a million Jordan Peterson's never occurred. So, you know, and that happens, it, that break happens all the time, everywhere in the universe, yeah. constantly, in every emergence vector you're looking. Potentials yeah. are Let me just underline that, um, and only one actuality occurs at any given time. And all the actualities that do occur at any given time together constitute the Baumian holoverse, which is what we call actuality. Yeah. Let me just underline here also that, that Baum, Baum is a materialist as well. So that's part of the explanation for why, why his theory creates a problem of anything new emerging, really. He's a dialectical materialist. But it's the idea that if all matter enfolded and then expanded, then like regardless of how complex the interaction is, there is no new things coming up. But that's different from what you're saying, Ebert. So I'm not, yes. I'm, not, I'm not saying that you and his theory are the same. I'm just trying to explain the way we use the concept, the implicate order in this context. And yeah. there's a really good question here that actually addresses this radically. And that is any prior universe, which is very unlikely there was one, either a compressed one, Baudrillard version, which might, Ebert might be a fan of, or the other one, which is a sort of dissolved Penrose version. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So you got a previous universe. Do you think all the laws of nature, which nature, I don't know, say physics, do you think all the laws of physics will be identical between the two universes? My bet is that, no, they were not. And possibly, yeah. if the remnants of the old universe, maybe in gravity or whatever, possibly if you find patterns eventually in the universe that are remnants of the previous universe, maybe inflation patterns themselves are that. If you start looking at those eventually, we go into subphysics, we will yeah. discover whether the previous universe are the same laws or not. And if the laws were in any way, even the slightest bit different than the current one, creativity and freedom suddenly occurs and exists. And it's a matter of fact. So that's a, that's a really radical thought experiment you can do when you, when you start considering Baudrillard's and Penrose's mm. you know, proposals here. The, this oh, really I, 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 I agree a lot. This really reminds me very quickly of the concept of the accursed share by Bataille, which is the idea that uh, an economic theory or, or even like with, with loads of the sun's rays and energy get wasted and only a small percentage gets actually transformed into life and biology in the planet. So there needs to be this waste of potential, the accursed share as per Bataille. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And we are so, as humans, we find it so fucking hard to deal with how much waste there is everywhere, simply because we are narcissistic and we think we're special and our mom taught us we were special and we were giving you the tip. But if you thought through who, you're, who you are, your subjectivity, you realize that, the, for me, there are an enormous amounts of Alexanders here, barred Alexanders here, every given moment. And only one of them will be actualized the next moment. And the next moment, only another one. And all of the mm. other Alexanders will never ever materialize, if I may use that word, mm. will never emerge anywhere whatsoever. But in retrospect- This is what Jordan Peterson cannot grasp, the way he loses it is that he just cannot grasp the enormous amounts of waste. And, and please note here, I love the word enormity and I hate the word infinity. But I love the word enormity, enormity, mm. smalls, enormities. There are enormities everywhere we look, and especially the enormities of actualities. When you start looking at the potentials, the, the potential collapses in the fields of potentials, the potential collapses in the fields of potentials, they, they, they're so, it's unfathomable. It's just beyond a fact. But it's still not infinite. It's just enormous. Can I, can I um, contextualize everything you just said as... Um this sort of uh, quantitative, qualitative, dialectical, you know, almost sort of Marxist notion of the dialectic and emergence. And I think that it's really beautiful. And let me know if you agree or not with this, but the way I hear that is the way that I understand uh, emergence itself of substance and my whole sort of substance subsistence relationship. But um, enough quantity produces a qualitative shift. And everything you've just said is that an enormity of potential, a, a million sperm. Well, what happens if there were 900 million, 99,000 fucking whatever, and it missed that one? It's that extra one, you mentioned a million. It's that extra sperm that actually gets in there. So there's this situation where you, have, you need a saturation of enormity. You need enough quantity to create the qualitative shift. And I think that that's a really nice and, and simple way to think of emergence, at least mm. in some, 
We oh, so call this, uh, exactly, we call this pan-dialecticism. Pan-dialecticism. It just makes no sense to speak about dialectics yeah. anything. It's absolutely universal. And if, it, if there's a single meta law, at least from after space-time occurred, and we have relations like space-time versus hyper-time. So we have relations, we have difference. That's a fact. And once yeah. we have that, dialectics is the only model that makes sense. The only thing that can be pan, anything that makes pan in any meaningful sense. And this is where I say with Bergson, why is there so much of everything is a much more fundamentally interesting question than the one of why is there something rather than nothing or nothing rather than something. Mm. I would like to add here that that even though I, I totally get the metaphor, we shouldn't necessarily describe like wasted semen as potentia, because it is like it is actual in the sense that it exists. When I'm That's talking because about, you're a fucking sperm drinker. That's what you are. <laughs> I'm more thinking. Of, luck, I'm more thinking. Luck, I'm more thinking if 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 if, if the Jordan Peterson sperm had hit the Jordan Peterson egg, I'm more thinking like, why wasn't there an abortion? <laughs> well, yeah, you really don't like him, do you? No, well, I like but, negations. I like negations. I, I love but, Jordan, but I'm I'm more interested it. in that question philosophical. But, but it's because we're predicting an, a new actual event of pregnancy and then birth. But if you look at like all the semen in the world. Um, <laughs> then, then it's all actualized. When, when I'm talking about potential, yeah, yeah. I'm talking of course, about. Of course. No, I'm talking like about. Um, of course. Like a particle existing in the superposition, there is a potential before it's actualized to either one of the positions, right? So right. that's what I mean by potential uh, in, in, in relationship mm -hmm. to actual existence. As being sure. stuck within space time and with the limited perceptual abilities that we have the continuity between actualizations that exist between me now, me yesterday, my parents, their parents, and all the lineage forever, through the rear view mirror, it's a lineage. Um, Peterson- Yeah, what, what do you mean, stock and space time? Finish. Peterson yeah. might say that that is a hierarchy, that that is the one thing, the one true chain, the golden chain. I believe that you're arguing the opposite, uh, Bard, or, or rather you're just implying that <laughs> That's that's the fallacy of looking at it in the rear view mirror. That's what Hegel means with that. We create necessity and hence sight, and we have to, otherwise we go absolutely mad. So Jordan Peterson has never read Hegel. Okay? This is the issue with the Christians, right, is that the necessity is presupposed as being there from the beginning. And God oh, it's, that religion is so vulgar, Over, Did you have to say the C word? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been battling it recently. I've been really trying to go oh, into like the Christian. Oh, all these little Western boys who want to go back to Christianity. You no, 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 I don't want to go to it. Oh, good, 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 good. Because I'm here Come in the Manchester movement, good, good. Alexander, good. and there's so it's, many Christians. Your, if Jordan Peters was the slightest bit informed and had studied the history of theology, would have been a Zoroastrian by now. He hasn't even studied Zoroastrianism, but that's a shame on him. But anyway, okay. So uh, there's another interesting thing here. You happen to mention a word that I would love to bring up with you guys, and it's the difference between discretion and continuity. Go for it. And, and, and continuity and, uh, oh, no, no, continuance, yeah, please. Well, okay, so the difficulty with gravity versus quantum theory is the quantum theory is completely built on discretions. And gravity theory, as Einstein pre predicted it, relative theory, re you know, relativity theory is built on continuities. So you do different mathematics. You do like shapes and, you know, circles and things. And then, you know, you, you know, pi, the, 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 the pi is there because continuity and discretion are actually incompatible with one another. Now it turns out, this is interesting. When you go to space time, and I think everyone will love this. When you go to space time, it turns out space time weave is built on discretions. Exact discretions with no space space in between. So like building blocks, it's like Lego blocks, all of it. And now when, you know, the little quantum gravity guys go into this deeply, they're just like, wow, that's amazing. We, that was a surprise. We thought we'd find some kind of continuity. Because when you ask a physicist, they say, everything we know so far about physics is all discretions all the way down to the Planck length. But we do expect there is some kind of hidden continuity beneath it all. Now, okay. Let's say this then, let's assume that I've always been pro discretions and skeptical of a continuity because well, continuity well, well, rhymes with infinity. But maybe the difference between subphysics and physics is that subphysics does deal with continuities because Ellen has convinced me that I could accept that when the fields of potential are not actualized, I could accept the continuity is somehow real. But discretions yeah. seem to be something as soon as the space time is here and everything that's dancing on top of it, it operates with discretions all the way down to the Planck length. What do you say? Also, in and also in retrospect, right? Like when you look, when you look at something in retrospect, 
there seems to be a continuity. While we're looking at the instance, it seems to be discrete. So I would say it's also a matter of perspective. Because if you look, if you look at a wave or, or something, like it, it looks to be a continuity of events, but we know that all events are discrete. But the way they relate to each other, the events, which are also discrete, creates an illusion. Or not, we should never use the concept illusion. But from, from a retroactive perspective, it creates a, a, a continuity. So I would say that the difference between continuity and discrete events are largely based on perspective as well. Well, it's like when you do mathematics, for example. So you do big mathematics, cosmological mathematics. Mm. Then it makes sense to use continuities because you can jump to the conclusions a lot quicker. But when you, when you bring on the big numbers, right, then suddenly the problem is that you get the wrong results. This could also explain why gravity and quantum theory haven't united because mm. you're working, one of them is working from, from continuity, the other one's working with discretions, right? So mm. um, then it turns out you need to go through the meticulous hard work of actually finding the discretions in there. And what's interesting in our time is, of course, our obsession with data have reminded mm. us the data is there is a once, and we know the spins of particles are on and off, et cetera. So we suddenly surrounded by the world. We find discretions in places we never thought we'd find it. And finally, that also solves the problem. You've got a turtles all the way down problem when you say there's some kind of mystical continuity beneath it all, when it turns out that actually discretions are all the way down to the Planck length. And whatever is below the Planck length is absolutely meaningless to even discuss. We call it pure mm. chaos in our philosophy because it's like, mm. just forget about that. Start the Planck length. And here is when Ebert's theories about compression get interesting as well, because mm. if that is so fundamental, discretion versus continuity, it could be the other primary relation. And if it is, then there is a meta law that Penrose has disregarded, but Baudrillard saw, which is that if a universe somehow dissolves or implodes doesn't matter, it will somehow recur in a very compressed state at Planck length with enormous power energy, whatever you want to call it. Mm. Yeah, and then, and, and then imbibe itself into, the, into substance with those hidden variables or potentia, which you're calling subsistence, which I think is a far superior word for all of this. Um, I just wanted to bring up that, you know, the, the discretion uh, argument, this is a total aside, but obviously it pertains to membranics. And, um, and then when we think of, you know, these discrete pockets of, uh, of society, what is the, um, the continuance? What's the continuant factor? You know, is it language? Is it information? What, what is it? And, and let's say that it's language uh, or, or information itself. Oh, lovely, because we're leaving metaphysics here temporarily, moving to narrative theory, but I'm perfectly fine with that. So what do you well, do in narrative yeah, I don't theory? Want to go there. I don't want to go too far. Okay, okay, okay. So the, perfect, because we call this pathos and logos. So the logos is the theorism of ones. You can reduce everything to mathematics in the logical universe, right, with logos. But then we say pathos is what machines cannot do. They cannot crack jokes. They cannot write great songs. They can only imitate. They cannot write sure. an original song. They cannot make an original work of art. They cannot do anything original. They, they cannot fuck. They have no sex life. Okay. All these elements that we human beings subscribe to as being deeply human, more human now than ever because they're not machinic. So because human is not becoming a negation of machine more and more, we will then go more and more into the pathical realm. And we can only understand pathos as continuity, but we will understand logos perfectly as discretions. Does that make sense sure. to you? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me. And I think that, um, I mean, if language is pathos in your worldview, I guess what I'm saying is, you know. No, 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 no. Your dick is pathos. Your, your mind is pathos. Your desire is pathos. Sure. But language is the dialectic between discretion and continuity as a dialectic between logos and pathos. These four men were obsessed with creating some kind of story that can get our two brain halves together, the two hemispheres together. And the way we do it is through mythos. Women's problem is that women are in mythos all the time, and their problem is to eventually, sometimes at least, divide mythos into the logos and pathos that's required. And this creates the beautiful dialects between men and women. I love it. But what I see is that women struggle with separating mythos into logos and pathos, and men struggle with getting logos and pathos together into mythos. And we always fail, which mm -hmm. is the beauty, which is why the story and the creativity continues all the time. Maybe this is metaphysics, but it is, I, I would emphasize that we're in a totally different emergence vector here that I call culture. No, exactly. And, they, and, and, you know, and you see these operations and you start to see, you know, uh, equivalencies. But 
um, I guess just the idea that, you know, there is still this basic substance. Let's say it's whatever. Let's say it's language. Let's say it's information and, and that, you know, mythos and pathos are these emergence vectors from configurations of language. But in the, you know, uh, you know, the, the elementary uh, scientific uh, realm and the, the, the realm of substance and subsistence, um, I don't think there is a problem between discretion and continuity because you have the underlying, you have substance. For me, I, I have substance which sort of uh, superimposes itself across the board. Um, uh, you, oh, sorry, did you say that language was a substance? I'm saying language is sort of the substance corollary when we're talking about society. Okay, okay. so, okay, fair enough. Uh, I use language as mythos, I use logos as mathematics, and I use pathos as jerking off and, and starting yeah. a drama. Because does this touch us or something that... Um... Sorry? Oh, so I was, I was going to say, well, then, is there some substrata of substance in the social in sphere? Is it information? You know, like, can we... Yeah, can we, sure. I mean, you have, you have an implicate order of... Uh, you have an implicate order of social interaction as well. That's like based on culture, based on like your genetics, like the way you perceive reality. Like in, in that alone, like I, I, sometimes I use an example that if you take a uh, hundred people who have never met each other to a deserted island, there would already be uh, like an implicate order there because there are some guidelines for how these interactions will, it's like, it's not like there is a, we have like a basic, uh, not rule set necessarily, but some habits for human interactions. So the potential is already there. But something I want to touch uh, on. Which, uh, can I, can which I just add to that? Can I, can I just add to that? that? What we beautifully do right now is that we actually define a quadrant here. That's very useful, I think. So you know genetics and you know epigenetics. So epigenetics only slight little temporary changes that jump on top of genetics. And they might stick for a few generations and they might become genetic as you proceed yeah. further in history. But it's also meaningful to do the same thing with memetics. What I discovered is that people do not understand memetics properly because when you do memetics, you know, how ideas are, you know, are also replicating among us. The problem is that people mistake really deep memetics, like deep ideas, like tribe, like, like family, like man, woman, penis, vagina, you know, the memetics, mm. deeply memetic. And they mistake that for their own little social constructions, which we then call epimimetics, which is a really great mm. term you should use. Mm. So I say, if something is a fad or a fashion, or it's just temporarily thrown around, and people talk about it like, it's important what tonality to cat you have, for example, mm. like woke culture today is completely epimimetic. And it's completely trying to disregard both the mimetic and the genetic, which is why it's so fucking dangerous. But it helps to use the quadrant and add epimimetics next to mimetics the way we do epigenetics at genetics. So we have one okay. thing that moves around very quickly, but doesn't stick that easily. But we have another one that moves much more slowly, but it's very, very grounded and hard to move. And that makes sense when you start studying implicate and explicate orders. That there's a certain amount of information that's incredibly valuable, like DNA, and that will go with you into the next phase or go explicate, but then there are also things that just jump around a little on the surface and don't pay too much attention to those when you start the bigger picture. Right, okay. let, me just, let me just finish my thought. So Daniel Fraga said earlier, well, we, we exist in space-time uh, as, as humans, and I, I would challenge that because like, then, like, if you think about the universe from a materialistic perspective, then everything is within space-time. But like, and we mentioned Bergson earlier, like when you look at something like memories, that's clearly transcending our normal comprehension of space-time. Not like, because if we only think about thoughts, memories, feelings as these informational blips, which happens within a physics-based vector, then we are back at materialism. So we have to allow at something entirely new existing when we go into culture. Culture is like outside space-time in the sense that it, appears across na like nations, enormous periods of time, even tribes that haven't interacted, like uh, start to invent like the same concepts. Uh, so, so we have to treat these things on their own merit as well. Completely agree. And so uh, not, we're saying not that, if, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so I was just gonna say, not if, as opposed to Frog saying, we exist in space time, not if we are space time. So I just want to keep throwing that out there that if we are, we are clearly, space we are clearly doing things with our thoughts that are closer to quantum mechanics. I mean, that's we are doing things. Sure. 
but that's much. But easier would you define yourself as some? I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that's much easier described as space. Um, well, I mean, quantum quantum mechanics is partly inside space time, but also quite p- partly outside space time, and, and our uh, thoughts, behaviors. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say, not necessarily. Like you know, I have some stupid. I mean, not not if you going. take. Okay, fair enough. Okay, but, do you think entanglement and, and, is part uh, of quantum I'm, physics? If entanglement is part of quantum physics, it's clearly operating outside of space time. Otherwise, it wouldn't be entanglement. So, yeah, the, well, there are phenomena that, here that are outside of space time, and, and that's how it works. Undeniably. Okay, but yeah, I have some really stupid thought experiment. But I'll, I'll, Alexander, what what can get into your room faster than the speed of light? Well, we have to understand that potential is not moving with the speed of light. I mean, when, when you're looking at quantum entanglement. No, that was sorry? a joke. A joke. There, there's a oh, okay. But, 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 but because you mentioned it earlier, you said that, well, if we have to explain entanglement, we might have to explain something which moves faster than the speed of light. You have like particles like tachyons which are, I think, mostly a mythical concept. Listen, listen guys, listen, but guys. Just, just the right way. Nobody oh, seriously finish. talks about well, Let me just finish. Let me just finish. Yeah, but entanglement is not explained through physics. People have given up on that. So just, just, just to realize. Exactly. Okay, good. We agree. These, we agree. These sort of, these sort of but, something but that travels because... the speed of light. It's no, instant. No. If it's instant, it doesn't travel. Yeah, yeah, it yeah it's instant. Travel. There, is no there, isn't, there isn't a transfer yeah. of... <laughs> they're, they're connected in the yes, sense that it's an instantaneous chase of a... Sorry, go ahead, Edward. No, I was going to say ahead. that whole thing of who who can get to your room along, who can get to your room faster than the speed of light? What can get to your room faster than the speed of light? So the joke is your room. Your room is already there. Sure. And guess what the fucking room is? It's space, dude. Space is everywhere. So if space is everywhere and it can already be everywhere at all times. Ebert, Ebert, just need- Ebert, Ebert, do you require time for that space? You're just describing space time, not space. You're describing. Wait, wait, but, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I understand the, the argument. Time. You're describing space time every time you're describing your space. That's not space. That's space time. Yeah, but you, you, you require but, being. There, there's a being that's, that's required not, in the space. So it's not slow down. Not space. <laughs> No, we need wait, a moderator. Let me explain, let me explain no. why I think it works. Let me explain why I think it works. All you need for compression, let's say there's invisible shit, which we know there is. There are all kinds of invisible space. All you need for compression is a boundary and saturation. That's all you need for compression to happen. Now, let's imagine that, that hypertime is compressed. It, there's, it's got a boundary, which is the universe of, of substance, and hypertime itself has a saturation within that boundary. It's invisible, but it's saturated. And once you take away Rolada, hypertime can persist over and as a feature of space-time in, non, in sort of non relata total relata as uh, uh, something far beyond locality, far beyond the speed of light. A tachyon, maybe it's a particle, but maybe it's also just simply... Pr- no, uh, no, darling, uh, darling, get off of the space-time thing. Just uh, oh, no. no. <laughs> I mean, it's not like... Look, it's not. It's not like it's not a valid. Uh, it's not like it's not a valid argument. But you are placing yourself in something which sounds like it's pan materialism, in the sense that everything is space and everything is yeah. ma- ma- matri- material substance. No, not necessarily. So, so, and, everything is space. So, so, so you have the intricate order. But you have everything in space. So, for instance, like um, you know, Wolfram's. Uh, but what uh, what is substance? Okay. Okay. So, but if you're saying, like, if, if you're saying that mind is also substance, we really have to define substance here. And the way you defined it earlier, it sounded like relationalism, which puts the relation before the substance. So I just want to make sure here, because the other option is going to like Marxist uh, dialectical materialism, where everything is just mutations of materia interacting, but that comes with like a giant bag of problems. Yeah, it's both to me. The, because it doesn't allow, it, because it doesn't allow emergence. But one implies the other to me. They're the same thing. Space and hyper time, same thing. It's just all. No, 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 no. If yeah. something is 
everywhere at the same time, it's not in space. It becomes meaningless to speak about space in that case. And there cannot be any speed or any traveling. But but, but, but gravity, like, okay, so if we talk about how information... Wait, 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 wait. wait, wait. Let me just just finish. Yeah, but to think space, to think hypertime, you got to really start making an effort thinking hypertime, seriously. You're going to make an effort to get out of this. Because if you're inside inside space-time... If you're inside space-time, information cannot travel quicker than the speed of light, right? It has to travel with gravity. So, so how, how does something, how does the information travel immediately if hypertime is not outside space-time? It's very possible that things move faster than the speed of light. No! Yes, it is. Move, but not instantaneously, because of movement, it can't move say, faster than speed. Listen, listen, listen. What, I've, what got a huge, listen is, I've got a huge tanker here, massive tanker, full of guns, atomic engine, everything. And you're sitting in a little rowboat, and you're trying to save yourself for the robot and save the robot no matter what. If you could just... Okay, no, no. I, okay, we're going to round up eventually the fantastic discussion, fantastic opening, and we're certainly doing the rise and fall of the universe, which we should do. I think we owe it to ourselves. But, but I want to say this, that I, I commend you guys to really think these things through rather than just throw things around and then take a certain vocabulary and throw it into a model. Because you are thinking properly within the models you're thinking. But when I, I, when I commend you to think hypertime, I mean, honestly, you've got to put some thought into this. And you have to think something where space is not a requirement. Just think it. If it exists or not, is it or I mean, let, me, or not. Let, me, let me just add a point to it. If, if, right, to even think even it, if, if we allow, can think it, if I can think it, I'm sure you can think it, right? That's the point. Okay. Right. Let me just even even if I, if we allow something to travel faster than the speed of light, and I'm not going to rule that out because I've seen a lot of Star Trek. So, but e- so even if we allowed that, it it, it would still not be instantaneous. No, because the 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 transfer of information would. If it existed within space time, would require like some sequence of event. What we see with entanglement is that it is entirely instantaneous, which suggests that it happens outside space time. And exactly. the same with it cannot happen in a universe with gravity in it. It cannot happen within space time because space time is decoherence, and decoherence comes from gravity. Read Penrose, right? Once you got gravity, you slow things down. So it cannot be instantaneous. So if do the things do happen instantaneously. They are definitely happening outside of space time, and that's evidence there's more than space time to this. That's, and my yeah, name and for that is hypertime. Now let's go and see what it is. Physicists either have a name for it, they can go and research and see how does that work? What is that? They're perfectly fine to do that, and they will probably have to leave physics. They will honor, they will honor <sighs> have to go and become sub physicists to be able to do that. That's my proposal. But hypertime is the name for that. And the reason why we chose it, I, a lot of people did hyperspace 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. And if you do a super string theory, you do hyperspace all the time. But why hyperspace died and hypertime survived and became the forefront was people simply realized that time is primary here and time is the only thing that connects different universes one another and space does not space time is emergent in our universe today so space is emergent out of space time and it is a quality of space time and and i haven't heard any one of you i have never heard a person talk about space without time I've never heard anybody talk about space that isn't space. So that's my never. whole theory never. is space without time. No, there Compress is no the such thing. thing. You, haven't well, thought, I mean, you haven't thought it. You just said it. Well, I think, I think, I, 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 I'm, I'm it's, a, I think it's a think. very interesting idea, Ebert. Uh, and I, don't, I, I actually don't think it's incoherent. I think it's very coherent. But I think that it leads to some problems down the way. So, so my, my problem with it is not that I don't think you have thought it through. I think you have thought it through. My, my problem is, okay, but what other things is then necessary to believe in? And one of these things is that I have a very hard problem uniting that with emergence. So the idea of radical, radically new things coming into existence. And because when I look at mind, for instance, it behaves more like quantum mechanics then it behaves like space-time. So, so, so uh, there are clearly things outside space and time. 
Yeah, and this is the great thing with emergence vector theory. So <laughs> once an emergence occurs along the hypertemporal axis, this is how you formulate it, mm. that means all previous emergence vectors that existed up to that point are part of the implicate order that results in that emergence. So everything that exists today will affect everything that happens tomorrow. Everything will have an effect on it within a neutral and modest universe. Yeah, and the absurd thing that it probably also works backwards as well. <laughs> because, no. because then the previous emergences are seen in a new light. No, that's storytelling. That's not how it works. That's storytelling. Well, ontology is partly storytelling. Yeah, but keep them different. To keep, that's why I said I emphasized before that when Ebert encouraged me to go into narrative theory rather than metaphysics, I said very, very different things here. So don't mix the two. Because students that are 19 years old will constantly conflict in one another, and that's actually tried to... Oh, okay, fair enough. But we, we, should, we, should, we should like distinct, make a distinction between ontics and ontology. Yeah. But it's true. But when we talk about physics, we, we also do it from a perspective of the technological paradigm that we are in. So it doesn't necessarily make sense to talk about physics if you are in a in a like old uh, tribe, for instance, because it's too abstracted from how you are interacting with the world. So my point is that we, as we also move through different technological paradigms, our understanding of ontology also changes because the way we interact with the world changes. Yeah, this is Hegel's basic argument. We have to rewrite history all the time to make sense of it. Yeah, and only then do we introduce necessity. Mm. It had to be this way. Because yeah. it led up to this. And it's incomprehensible to think that the world could be different from that. That is exactly why it's so boring to see movies where Adolf Hitler won the war. Because it assumes so many things that just didn't happen. So it's just boring. It's just boring. It's just, it, 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 the whole verse gets so incredibly, incredibly, incredibly complex. And the fact that the actualities that do occur, do occur, that they're so unlikely and that they still occur, and that creates a pattern. So we have these sort of wave function collapses. Mm. There are actualizations of relations. That's the way you describe them. And these actualizations of relations then become the relata, who then go into the next relations and so on. And that becomes the next relation. Then it just goes on and on and on. But the potential drown the disappearing in that process all the time is just immense. Mm. And that's in a way what a wave function collapse is. It is, it is when a very, very complex system, due to the pressure of decoherence, is forced into one point. That's how I would describe, for example, a particle compared to a field. It's just like, so there's suddenly that sort of minuscule point, which is the relation itself. And from that new, new potential comes out and that becomes the next relation, the next relation, next relation. And these relations are probably we then call discretions when we look at the world. I agree with sure. all that, yeah. That fits into the, you know, the oscillation and then diminishment of the amplitude and then equilibrium. You need death for the recreation, for the amplitude to rise. For dynamism, you know, you just need death as that center or whatever we want to call that. Yeah, uh, we, that we, know, we know that, we, we know that if you think of a process, for example, if you think of the process, if that process would, would be allowed to go all the way through to the very end, we would know how it would end up because the probability would, would end up with the equilibrium. But what actually happens is that process only goes to a certain point, then it interferes with another process, and that's what a relation is. And suddenly, something happens there that is not determined, precisely because the relation creates the transdeterminist and, uh, situation. And that is what an actuality is. That is why I'm so interested in freedom and creativity here. And, and freedom with Hegel was creativity and Whitehead. They mean exactly the same thing when you study them. And what they mean is that this creates the potential all the time for rethinking the world in all kinds of different positions. And that is what we do as human beings. We take one process and do not fulfill it. We don't let it go to the very end. We throw that into another process. And that's why we use tools as we do, you do art. When you're a musician, so you throw something else into that and create a relation that you actually, as a subject, created or partly created and affected. And that's exactly why you're so thrilled about it, because you did have an effect on the world. And the entire history of the universe took off in a whole new direction because of your simple action that you just did. Yeah. It's kind of mind-boggling, isn't it? This is kind of interesting because now we're getting to that intersection between the hard metaphysics and the narrative theory and kind of how society is constructed. And I mean, like me and Fraga, right, we're really social philosophers and this is techno-social after all. So this is kind of where we're really interested in. And I guess the interesting question is like, how does this theorizing of hypertime begin to have implications on how we 
construct new narratives, new religious stories about ourselves today. Like I mentioned, I've been kind of battling with Christianity at the moment and basically against that idea that somewhere it is all written. And even like, even, you know, there's a kind of Christian sleight of hand. It's like, oh, we have free will, but somehow God is still moving it towards whatever's supposed to happen anyway. The end is kind of imminent in the beginning. And to me, it seems like a cop-out. They just kind of want to like say that there's no responsibility for actually, there's not real free will there. No, no, not free will. Freedom and will have nothing to do with each other. <laughs> Just skip yeah. free will. It's a boring concept. Yeah, yeah. There's freedom of choice at best. And, and freedom of choice, for example, is when Ebert, when he's writing a song, then throws in things into process, break those processes, so the breakdown, going to wake function, collapses those are relations, and a whole new song comes out of it. But so, the Christian so, would say, right, that the song that he's written is the song that God always wanted to be written. Yeah, but they're wrong. Okay, okay. But yeah, no, so, completely, okay. completely. Okay. So, so why I'm saying. against Christianity and Islam, I give you the argument here, is that when you go deep into the Middle East, philosophy and theology, you discover that within Zoroastrianism and Judaism, you had a separate religion for the priest that really dealt with absolute truth. They called the Sadducites and they killed Christ in Judaism, and they're called Zervanites in Zoroastrianism. And this is like the priestly call when you're like, you're a young guy and you have a priestly predisposition, you have a very strong psyche, which is exactly what's required of a good priest. So they would just go and ask, okay, are you ready for the ultimate truth, no matter how horrible it is? And that is who you are. You will take that on. And of course, then that ultimate truth is that God does not exist. And if God exists, then God is just time, Zurvan in, in Zoroastrianism. God is just time. And time is a monster, gender neutral monster beneath it all that doesn't care shit about us. So you as a priest have to go out and pretend you talk to God and God cares about people because then they will listen to you. And then you must wisely say what God should have told people. And that is the fundament of Jewish religion or Zoroastrian religion. And this is what gets lost in Christianity and Islam. that are just pop versions of the same thing. So the pop version of Judaism became Christianity. The pop version of Zoroastrianism became Islam. And my critique of these two religions is they're dualist. They talk about afterlives. They talk about supernatural things and all that shit. And when I started the Sadakites, and these scriptures are 3,000 years old. And when I started the Sermon, they never believed in anything supernatural whatsoever. None. No afterlife. Nothing. That's just nonsense. That's just escapism. That's just narcissism. They really went after these hard questions that we're going after here right now. Like, what does it really mean to try to embrace and survive within a completely contingent universe? And we hate to hear that. Christ- Christians hate to hear that. And the last thing Christians would try to say in the Christian religion will be that there must be something pre-programmed or reordered within which I have meaning, and therefore I'm just supposed to like a robot to do something, and therefore I'll be loved by God. When, when all of that is just horror when you think through it properly. That's why there's not a single word about heaven in Islam or Christianity, because it could be nothing but horror if it existed. And this is what the priest taught within Zoroastrianism and Judaism. That's what I love about the Sadakites and Servanites. What we now do with an increasingly transparent world that we live in today is that all of these genies are out of the bottle. And we live increasingly in the shock, the nihilistic shock that we get out of that is spreading like wildfire. And people jump to the most craziest, weirdest ideas. We're gonna have so much fucking astrology and conspiracy theories and idiocies out there. Democracy is dead because it's gonna go lunatic the next few years. That's that precisely sucks. where we're getting to the ontological design hypotheses, right? And it's like, we really have to just start. It's like, we're all priests trying to make up that own truth. And you like, guys I, have to work with Daniel Smackenberg and Sachs down at the guys, the Concilius Proud in America, because that, that's the best product I've seen for years coming out of North America right now. And that's exactly what they're trying to do. What does it really mean to take on the priestly commitment of actually constructing ontological design? Because that kind of order is needed at least if humans are going to be. But I think it sounds to me like those guys are really interested in like, does, or they're working with uh, the information sphere. Whereas like, I think ontological design gets really fucking radical interesting when you're actually in the sphere of designing ethics itself. It's like designing what we allow ourselves to say yes to and to say no to. And I don't see that coming out of those guys because they're still somewhat humanistic. They're still basically in the frame of like, we're trying to make the world better for everybody and everyone. I have those arguments with Dennis Magdeburg all the time. He's on the side of life. I'm on the side of intelligence. So, you know, fundamentally. So, uh, 
which is kind of li- liberating for me to be on the intelligence side rather than life side, because life can be very stupid, apparently, especially human life. But anyway, uh, I am not interested in saving humanity. Maybe Danish Magdeburger is. And I don't think you guys are either. We rather, we rather are priests, I think, in the sense that whether humanity survives or not, we don't know. It, this is a fat chasm will disappear. But, you know, and at the end of the day, humanity is not going to conquer outer space anyway. Certainly AI with some robots and some bacteria will do the job much better. So... Is it really interesting for us, really? And I think we're going to arrive with Protestant events. So Dick Vesna is basically saying that there was always this dream that men envied women for giving birth to children. And I think deepest down, the dream is that the man will one day give birth to a child and the name of that child is technology. And we mean technology in the sense that it will kill human beings and make us extinct and we'll be happier for it. I think that idea is a radical. I want to take it just to challenge people that way because I'm not a humanist. I'm really not. I don't see the point. I'm with the cats and the dogs as much as the humans, personally. But uh, it's not my job. It's just my job to describe in a Nietzsche sense, describe in Hegelian sense, describe it in the lesson sense, what mm. is going on. And I love working with you guys on doing these things. And I think it's great that we're bringing up this here in public as well, that ontological design, yes, I, if I was skeptical about your sort of Deleuzean you know, narcissism or, or your big headedness or, you know, your super egos a year ago, I'm with you totally now. You know, you were promising a year ago, but I think you're definitely on the right one. And my father told me he didn't even want to be a philosopher, want to be an architect. And I was just like, yeah, it's like Mano de Landa. He's probably getting there too. It's just like architecture is, is really philosophy in construction. It is from now on. And hey, that's fantastic. Well, that's, I think ethics is a design thing. Ethics is a p- fundamentally a technology. An ethical code is a way of saying yes to certain things and no to certain other things. It opens a certain sphere of potential. And once I start thinking ethics just as a technology, that's where I can be very Nietzschean because designing new values mm. is just what you can do all the time. What is the ethical code appropriate for this moment in history and space? And then you might want to have meta ethics, meaning you design two different systems to then compete. I'm okay, interested in the Chinese love you guys yeah. already, but the Chinese just want Xi Jinping to be flattered and they want one system, period, and then gamble on that one system. Whereas I am a proponent of the Persian imperial order, which became the US constitution, which is like install at least the trika, install at least the triad, and see, make sure these triads compete with one another because evolution is much better than dictatorship when it comes to developing things that are sustainable. But that at least is giving humans a better chance to collaborate with the machine. But you're right, Owen, you're absolutely right. The AI will ask us this one thing when it stands in front of us. So what is the ethical code for our communication and our relationship? What would that relation be like? And yeah, I, I have to run to the best real quick. Just want to let, okay. uh, I don't know if anyone yeah. else does, but I'll be right back. I would actually challenge that notion of, of ethics being a technology because I can certainly imagine, or we can certainly see that people are trying to develop different ethical systems. I mean, democracy, in some sense, is a giant experiment in that. But we also have to realize that, well, if we are using the concept work or not work, just like with technology, then we are already measuring it against an ideal. So we have an ethical ideal to begin with. And we have, a, just as we have a technological ideal to begin with. So it's like, it's true, I can develop a new technology but, and I can develop a new ethic, but we are always measuring it against an ideal. So we have an internal sense of ethics which are built into us. So we can't just invent an ethic that doesn't correspond to that. And that's what basically we saw with Nazism and communism and other, one could argue, Nietzschean attempts to replace our ethics. So, uh, so uh, I that's, think, what, that's what I call metaethics. You know, I logically am to the meta prefix, but that's what I call metaethics. So, yeah. that would be like, for example, but, be heroic and never be victimhood. Or, or, yeah. or, or, or and like I just said, it, it turns out, pragmatically speaking, throughout history, that if you create systems that compete with one another, somehow what comes out of that is more sustainable than just go for one system only. So, so. No, it's, I'm, I'm very much for competition. Uh, I, and I think, like, I'm, I'm a humanist. So, I'm, 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 the, I'm the Alexander who's for. Uh, Ebert is still undecided. <laughs> or we don't yes. know about Ebert yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm totally pro humanity. Um, sorry, yeah, Faga, go ahead. Let me jump in with something here. Let me try to bridge um, uh, kind of the two threads that, that we've explored in this podcast. So imagine behind the barred absolute, the secret secrets of the secrets of the priests. Um, there's something that 
we don't know what was there in the other times in the other religions and i guess that coming to this point we kind of have to invent it and then we just uh we we also explored that in uh, Elon, you said and i kind of agree with that that there's things you can't really measure uh, with the um, priesthoods of the time, namely academia or science, such as you can't really weigh dreams or that there's perhaps, uh, and you use that as a way to refer to the fact that there exists a quantum entanglement, there exists something outside of space time, there exists a hyper time. And I'm interested in the bridge and that little black hole portal. If it exists, maybe it's a story we'll inv- we're inventing right here. Either way, I'm interested in, in that black hole that exists either within the heart of the priest or within that barred absolute, the, the santum santorum. And what kind of transmutation, what kind of membrane there becomes accessible for the priest who will invent the ark for the new ages, um, whose meta ethics might be deemed, does it work or does it not work? Is there something well, to, begin, to, to, to begin with the barred absolute, we just say that the reason why the barred absolute is widely distributed is not because it's closed for people or barred, but actually because so few understand it. Mm-hmm. So yeah. we're having a conversation here right now that maybe a few hundred people could follow in the world. You, you anybody else. The, so we, the fact that so few people can understand what we're talking about means it sounds gibberish to everybody else. And in a way, that's what you do. For example, you travel abroad, you speak a language. For example, we would speak Danish and Swedish here right now, and the three of you, the three other of you would not understand what we say. So, so the Bard Absolute in itself is so fiendishly hard to comprehend. So this is like the ultimate knowledge about how things operate. What is the ultimate knowledge about the human condition? And that is, of course, what to get at. And then the priest is trained to use his maximum capacity to go for what, what uh, I think Andrew Davis calls it, ultimacy. So like, where would be the ultimate point I could get to try to comprehend as much as possible of this whole universe thing that I'm immersed in, right? And we're trying to get it right here. We're obviously behind the Bard episode. And the Bard episode works because... We're not going to have millions of people to follow this podcast because it's way too advanced for the vast majority of people. So I just want to say that to frame the Bard Absolute to begin with. Sure. So, so the Bard Absolute is sort of the inherent obfuscation of the advanced state. Is that no, right? Okay. The Bard, the Bard Absolute is what makes a child different from an adult. So children are not ready for fucking and things like that. So sure, sure. then adults are not ready for things. And adults, well, adults are not ready for when, they, when you go to the shaman. And the shaman tells you, you're not ready to drink ayahuasca right now. It's too risky for you. You're not there yet. That's a bard absolute. And the bard absolute are fundamental to Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, Taoism, and Judaism. But the bard absolute was thrown out the door in Christianity and Islam because when Christ died on the cross, all of heaven was accessible to everybody. And it's from this idea in Christianity and Islam, we get the idea that everybody can comprehend everything. And people are furious when they don't understand things because then you haven't explained it. Well enough. Which well, is- I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's true because, like, there is a reason why Jesus, oh, God, appears as a bush, and that's also because, like, that's true Judaism. Is- that's not Christianity. That's Judaism. Well, it's, it, well, it's Christians also use that story. So yeah, that es- eschaton, they all they also eschaton. use that story. No, they say but, that up um, until Christ died on the cross, the Bard Absolute was in existence. So Christian theology is adamant that up until Christ died on the cross, but when the curtain falls in the temple, that's exactly what it means. It means that the difference between the sacred room and the most sacred room has disappeared, and the most sacred room is now available to all. And this is also what Christian atheists and atheist theologies, theologies going to Christianity, try to say, like René Girard, for example, or Jordan Peterson, for that matter. This is what they try to hang on to Christianity. Like Christianity was in a Nietzschean way tied to its very death at the very end. It was li- really, literally the death of God on the cross. Okay, that at least is a credible version of Christianity today, but it's a total rewrite of Christian history. So, so let's imagine, well, I mean, it, it also exists in Gnostic. I, I think I think you're taking it too lightly. Like you can know God through His love and Christianity, but you cannot know the full extent of God. And I think what's really important here okay, is also okay. to understand. I, I, th- I think Christian, uh, theo- I think let, Christian let theology finish. is let another discussion. I don't think it's this discussion tonight. Okay, let me just finish. Yeah. But yeah. another important aspect of the bad absolute is also that meaning requires lack for it to be meaning. So. Like if you have anything which is supposed to have a meaning, it cannot be identical to what you're describing. Oh, because yeah. then I could just show you the thing. Okay. So okay. a part yeah, of the yeah, part I'll, absolute. I'll explain, yeah, yeah. Let's explain that. That's how nihilism works. So nihilism are four stages. 
The first nihilism mm. is naive nihilism. It's like, I don't know that God is dead. I don't know the paradigm is over. I don't know we're living in a new time yet. It's just, I just see the things around me, but I don't understand that. Cynical nihilism, I understand we live in a new paradigm. I know that it, the old dead, it's God, God, God is dead. We need a new God. So then you live in a cynical, I always say that the Clintons going to church on a Sunday is the most cynical nihilist operation you could ever see. They certainly don't believe in Christ, but they go to church anyway to win favors politically, okay? So the cynical nihilism. The third and the fourth one, though, are parallel one. They're called ironic nihilism and affirmative nihilism. And the ironic nihilism and the nihilism of the priest says that irony here it's a great foundation on which to build new values, as Owen said. And then you transpose from the priest his will to intelligence. You transpose onto the chief ten or the king the will to transcendence, which is the guy who with a hammer hammers out the new values, which starts with ultimate freedom. The old paradigm is over and dead, and we're now in a historical position. We can hammer a new promised empire or promised land out of nothing. And that, and that is nihilism. That's, that's where all the li- liberation of nihilism comes from. Let me go into that and, and propose a thought exercise. Imagine we're, we're in the process of this neurological panspermia. We need to seed out different ideas of different potentialities for, uh, you know, cultic houses that people will live in. A lot of them will fail. Perhaps they must. It's the accursed share. And perhaps some of them will work. Now, for the creators and the priests that are going to go and actually do this little experiment out there, for the creators of the realities that will be in competition, Ebert, your, your sentence, these, these, these people, I would claim that they need to do a certain act of divination, the mediation, and, and to be in the membrane between the quantum and the space-time, the real and the actual, the non-existent, the nothing, and what you actually have to tell the other people, and it has to work somehow. So that process, that operation can we? Can, well, do you get, do you guys have any practical yes. operational thoughts on that's, that? That's a really that's a really great. I like that you keep trying to bring it back to the first half of the conversation, right? Um, all of these, the the Bard absolute equal it, it has a dis, equivalency in discretions themselves, um, if I'm not mistaken, right? And um, and this idea of nomadology, which is what you're describing, the ability to move between uh, membranics, right? Where is that in the universe? What travels between discretions? And that's essentially what you guys are describing as hypertime, in my view, where the thing that can travel between discretions informs all discretions at once. It's non-relational, and yet it under it's the subsistent order. Bard, you're shaking your head. Yeah, because it doesn't travel. Hypertime cannot travel to the outside of space. If you don't have space, sure. you can't travel. So but that's all. It, the, but the, but other, the other part of the other part was good. You're good. Yeah, you're no. good. You're really good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. As long as whoever's watching that even gives a shit has a sense <laughs> of the, the space between us here. Okay. Um, uh, anyway, so I, I just like the idea of, you know, so you're bringing up. I think an interesting point, and if we can agree on on some level that whatever discretions exist in space time um, are being uh, nomad nomadologized, or or somehow there is an interrelational uh, web uh, that is ferrying uh, one thing to the other. It's like atoms; you know, they never actually touch each other. They're just conferring bosons. They're just trading bosons. You know, they never touch. And I think, you know, that's also obviously, a, 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 you know, apropos of... Um, of uh, I'm a little confused with applying nomadology here. Can you maybe expand on that? Because I associate nomadology with tribes, like human I mean, that, tribes. That is, and that's, that's, that's because you work with the Bardian nomadology, but this is the Lelusian nomadology. So it's oh, okay. slightly different. So let's let, let, let keep nomadology here. Because we nomadology, when we work with it, is the opposite of eventology. But nomadology, when the lust works with it, just things that move, basically. Mobiles. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, so there's... I mean, in the, in the, but, but like, I think your definition of nomadology f- is, far, is far more encompassing than the loose, the loose. I've only read in the, what is it called, the war machine, where I mentioned it briefly. Yeah, he plays with the didn't... word. I, and I took the liberty yeah. as a son of the lust to actually formulate nomadology. Yeah. And I take it literally. It's the teachings yeah. of our nomads live. And that could be anything okay. that it's nomadic. It doesn't have to be human. So things that constantly have to be in the move to have some kind of existence would then be nomadological phenomena. Which, by the oh, way, okay. are, are photons. 
Photons are never actually at rest. So they never actually have no mask. No, ma They never actually have no mass. I just want to make sure everyone understands. They're always substance because they're always on the move. They always have energy, which means they're carrying, you know, you could... Uh, no, 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 no they're, in, they're, they're interacting relation again with the Higgs field. And that's why they get mass. Sure. You cannot have mass without a Higgs field. So the photos sure. themselves do not have the mass. And sure. again, a, a lot of guys who like but, to fuck women think that they're united with the woman. Actually be surprised that actually the penis and vagina never meet. Sure. So that's a better example here, I think. Sure, but photons are nomadological, yeah. right? Photons are, yeah. are, are, are nomadological. So I mean, I, everything is nomadological I mean, in that sure, sense, maybe right? Maybe everything, but they're in, in the context of society, not everything is, right? Almost, okay. almost nothing is except for the fundamental building blocks, whatever it is, language, uh, mythos, pathos, all, all the basic shit. And, um, and then a couple instantiations of beings that are able, maybe they're the shamans, whatever the case is, that gives them the free pass um, to sort of, to be the mimetic uh, viral carriers from one, uh, from one grouping to another, from one cell to another. The, the, this um, is what they call process event. You're beautiful here, Bert. You, you get it completely. This is what they call process event. This is what the Persians invented on the side of the Chinese and the Indians 4,000 years ago, was the idea that that event can then change forever. And this is the lowest difference in repetition. It's the same idea. So it's like, if everything just repeats, it doesn't repeat exactly mm. the same way. And this is where you get to the yeah. Perosian idea that the previous universe and this universe could be very, very, very similar, but not exactly the same universes. And that's exact, that difference makes all yeah. the difference in the world. So difference in repetition at the lowest means that the small, small, small difference with each repetition makes all the difference in the world. And when we see that and start accumulating these differences, which we do with the events 4,000 years ago. We started to write down things that then survive us. So we die, but the text is mm. left. And that accumulation of information enables civilization. And that is probably- Yeah, I would probably think- Yeah. I would probably think about it in a Jungian sense that we have the archetype and then the manifestations of the archetype are always <laughs> different. I like, because you're a law guy. You want, you want yeah. laws. You want laws underpinning and then we, and then we embody the laws. He's a closet yeah, but, uh, He's a closet Jew. That's <laughs> so Jewish. <laughs> and that's what you're where saying. Are the laws? Where are the laws? Some kind of ethical the laws? Where are the laws? There's yeah. some ethical absolute where I say no. It's like the ethic is just a habit of nature. It's a way. Well, right, but the problem right, is right. the problem is the why 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 some habits are not other habits. Huh? But why? Why some habits and not why other not, habits? Why not? Well, you try some habits, and some habits why? are fucking dreadful, and some. Wait, wait, wait! I got a word for this. Oh, and I got a word for this. It's called no. parad paradigmatics. Paradigmatics is that there are certain things about human beings that almost are timeless. I'm not saying they're timeless, but because they do not change over time, we call them genetic and mimetic. Okay. On top of those, we have epigenetic and epimimetic phenomena that change very rapidly and temporarily. So, and they change according to the paradigm. So if we now live in a digital age and the internet's taking over the world and AI then have all the satellites and access to that, it's a completely different world to the industrial capitalist age we lived in before. That means that requires a new set of ethics. So I take Nietzsche more literally than he does himself. I'm not saying he ever deals with the death of God, he deals with the death of a paradigm. And that is where new ethics come into the picture and new values need to be created. And you either step forward as the chieftain or the king and say, oh, I'm going to create new values, you know, sort of Nietzsche and aristocrat. Or you step back and say, Nietzsche actually needs to separate his world to power into world to intelligence, which AI can do and priests do normally. And then the world to transcend, which still humans need to do because we have dicks and pussies or whatever. And, and the, the will to change the world and set new ethics out there. It's the will to transcend us, but the will to com compile all human history, to understand deeply what it means to be human in a more permanent sense. And on top of that, add the more temporary aspect means we go from pragmatics to paradigmatics. And that is why I think you should now start making an ontological design that is deeply paradigmatic to the age we live in. Yeah, but the thing is that meta ethics never changed, right? Like we are looking at different system of ethics, but we are still seeing if they are working in relations to an ideal of ethics we have. I you mean, that ideal. If, does it work? Well, it, probably, probably something like Lucas, right? No, I no, mean, wait, 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 wait. Something wait, like it has wait, wait. to. Let, let me give an example of these things where the epimimetic and epigenetic come in. So, when we work with this stuff, we work with populations and we work with scale. 
And it's really, really easy to go from family to clan up to tribe, which is 1,200 to 1,500. Number number is the clan size. Because these size people are com- totally comfortable with. Any fucking idiot can operate with an environment of 1,200 people. Because we operate in that environment for hundreds of thousands or millions of years. But, but let me just answer there, wait, 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 there are only there, Then there are only two larger population scales that we operate with, where we have laws that, that Ebert Elu loves. So, and they're called nation and empire, and they were developed by the Persians <laughs> and the Jews. And that's when we go to those models and see, so who created the most sustainable empires, most resilient empires over time? Who created the most sustainable, resilient nations over time? And then you go to Judaism and Zoroastrianism. And, and what we do then is we gave the pattern, and we say, it takes an effort. And because it takes- Well, I don't actually love laws Then, then, then at it's all. a new I'm, ethics. That's a new ethics. Because you have <laughs> tribal ethics, tribal ethics, and suddenly you have imperial and nationalist ethics, and those have to operate. Okay. And they so, do now. So, they do have to operate. So Locas, Locas is not a law. Locas is a general principle. So we have to, like, I, I'm a law, I was a trained lawyer, and I'm also an anarchist. So we have to understand the difference between those two concepts. So I love your what I'm talking- Go on, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but what I'm talking about are, are general principles. So we can try out an ethical system, but if it results in, in chaos and people getting killed, then we abandon it. So okay. there's clearly a, a, there's an ideal here, which is that, well, it has to be functional, but functional in relation to what? And that is the meta Ethical well, system. It has to permit some degree of survival, but depending on the paradigm, you're talking about different degrees of survival. Like, well, there's more than survival it because doesn't. because it doesn't. Let's okay. say let's say being a raping warrior tribe like like the Vikings, for instance, there are, there are actually more traitors. But let's imagine like pillaging and warring and raping, that that stops working because nobody's willing to play with you. So at some point, they go become more traitor and less rapey. Because it's a more functional strategy. But that From point, that develops an ethic. No, that, that, that's just no. because the paradigm itself has upped the scale. You're forgetting paradigm here. So the paradigm changes those conditions that require the behavior to change accordingly. That's my point. So I would say... Well, it's, it's also you, because that cooperation is more... Cooperation no, is no, much no, more it's efficient. Not, it's not timeless. It's not time. It's so paradigmatic. You're describing paradigm. It, um, it, I'm, not, I'm not saying there's not paradigm. It's a, rival saying... written, it's a rival written language in Northern Europe that forces the Vikings to stop plundering and start trading. It's a rival of new technologies, new technological conditions. Well, I'm not, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying it's not based on paradigms. What, what I'm saying is that we, like ethics are, are evolved, we are evolving our technology of ethics to meet the meta-ethical like, requirement or the meta No, 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 I disagree strongly on this one. You, you overrate well, human capacity. Well, I mean, you're more. seeing, yeah. but, no. but why, why, are all, why are all countries in the world moving in the same direction? Can I, can I because because they're forced from to because of a paradigm. It's Marish McLuhan here. Well, the paradigm is built into Logos. No, so, I mean, no. No. So you can't just abstract it. You're describing a, a telos to ethics, right? A teleology yes. to ethics. Yes. Okay. So what is it heading towards then? Or or why what 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 the fundamental can... oper, what operational uh, laws uh, can can you apply to, to to convince me that there's a teleology to ethics? Well, you could take it from a lot of different perspectives, right? So you could take it from a mythical perspective and say we're moving towards the kingdom of God or something like that. Okay. But then you could take it from a biological perspective. <laughs> then, then we could take a biological perspective sure. and, and say, well, it's a, it's a sort of Darwinian evolution to more efficient states. But efficient. it doesn't have to become, Effic- a, efficiency. Have to become a wasted uh, potentiality. Therefore, metaethics uh, is kind of this verb that is continuing. That's my point that I wanted to make a yeah. ago, that, that intelligence is a verb, is a process, is a habit of a paradigm. And in mm. metaethics, you know, does it work or does it not work? Or does it get us better tomorrow uh, than we are today? That in itself cannot, is not fixed. Uh, to say it's a direction is, is even... Is, is Very good order. point, Frank. Very good point. So I'd be careful with math ethics here. The way I describe emergence vector theory, I said, be very careful with subphysics. I'm not that interested in subphysics, but I'm ki- interested in killing physics status as first science. That's what I'm interested in. Wait, wait, Ellen, I've got to finish this one. So I'm interested in the here and now. I start with the here and now, everything I do. It's very good lesson. It's the here and now that's interesting. So what, how do we look at the world from the here and now where, where we are right now? And in that sense, yes, tone down the meta ethics here. But what I'm saying is that, and I again said it in citation marks, I said, there's nothing timeless about human beings, but our genetic 
construction changes very little over time, at least until now, whereas the mimetic constructions change a lot more and the epimimetic and the epigenetic change very quickly. And because of that, I am a strong advocate of paradigmatics as the foundation for ethics, not metaethics as the foundation for ethics. So I agree with you, Herr Frank. Uh, well, I, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily think we we have to divorce those two. I think metaethics and paradigmatics can can work together because the reason why we have a metaethics is, of course, because of a given paradigm. Like at some point in history, and this is no, also what what no, the no, I don't use the term. No, no, I, never, I, never, I never use the, the, the term. The, the difference term. between the never. old the old that's testament ethics, and the new ethics, not meta. The difference between the old testament and the new testament. Is that when they when the Jews stopped traveling, it required a new form of ethics. Yeah, but, but it's also yeah, but it's also so we, not let me just finish part. Let me just finish. That's paradigm. So yeah. Yeah, but I'm not saying those two are the boss. Because like even God had, had to in the Bible, even God had to undergo a change. He had to be born and then die to replace uh, dogmatic ethics with the golden rule or dialectics, dialectical ethics. But those two are based on two different uh, structures of society. So I'm not saying, I'm not saying, let me just finish. I'm not saying that mythoethics can't change with a paradigm, but I'm also saying there is an evolution in paradigms which works towards greater complexity. And uh, the word mythoethics is never used that way by anybody except you right now. It's called paradigmatics and it's called ethics. Metaethics is already well, very, very That's not, that's not true. I wrote, I wrote my thesis on metaethics. That's not true at all. Okay. I, mean, I, mean, I totally agree with you. you say metaethics is a movement towards greater complexity, but then you can't make any other, you can't project any humanistic sentiments on that. Like, exactly. why does complexity have to include us humans? Exactly. But even more to the point, if you're going to be a humanist, you cannot involve efficiency. <laughs> you can't. Well, that's just as the perspective from like, a, like um, that's a way of explaining it. Right, but, but, but because like they're like Nazism, Nazism is super efficient but not ethical at all, right? But the problem, like the problem, like but I the problem think is that they have an ethical. I think Nazism was agreement. incredibly ethical. Yeah, that's not the problem. The problem <laughs> was you're using ethics. a Christian ethic to evaluate. <laughs> that. Oh, no, he wrote everything in his book and he then implemented it. And he but killed himself word, when he lost. Well, it was very ethical. It, it, it was it was indeed an ethical system, but it was not ethical. In the sense yes, that yes, it didn't it was, align with a greater good. No, it was it there's no greater good. That's your point. That's <laughs> your point. Peterson. That's a blind spot. There is no greater good. There is no. <laughs> well, we're, 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 well, this is where we are in disagreement. This is why you're different. Yeah. Because because I I do believe I do believe there are concepts such as good and bad and no, no, like no. Otto and Asha, for right. instance, no. functional and not functional. No, there's nothing to do with good and bad. Never mentioned that with Asha and Druj. Never combine those two. No, 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 no. I'm saying no, no. Okay, fair enough. We have had this discussion before. Never. But I'm saying that two. functional, functional, and non-functional. No. And no. then Asha, my, my, Asha, Asha is simply having a constructive mindset according to what you know about the world. We wake up in the morning and contemplate. That's all there is to it. There's no good or evil at all in Zoroastrianism. No, I'm saying I'm saying that there is like the, the fundamental duality. No, no, no. No, it's it's just no. it's just to okay, make fair enough. I'll, I'll leave I'll leave this or re, re, no, no, this, this, this is behind going them, back but. to Daniel and Owen here and the creation of values. The point with Asher and Druj, same as with Taoism. The point is that you wake up in the morning because you have potential to act that day and have a certain control of your actions that you identify with. You want to identify with your actions. So you concentrate on how you think and how you speak and how you behave and how you act. And then that becomes next day's person who then repeats the process. Okay, what, what's the underlying ideal that? here? Because Constru like the way, the way you're the explaining only, it- Wait a second, let me finish. The only idea is that you must take responsibility for what you identify with in that process. Okay. What ideal are you, are you? What ideal are you measuring responsibility against? None. There? None. But that then is unintelligible. No. If there's no ideals, then it's not intelligible. It has worked for three thousand seven hundred years really well. It's the most successful. No, I, I would argue that they have they have ideals. No. I would argue that they have ideals. No, not from the religion itself. No. Okay, but what are what are you measuring responsibility against then? Like, is it responsible to cheat? Is it like, if is it is it to steal? No. Again, like, if your, nobody sees me, I steal, just said that if you like what, Alan, if you listen, if you listen to what I just said, it's your own measurement of your own subjective experience that is the only measurement that counts. 
if you're a Zoroastrian. Okay, so let's take the Dostoevsky in question. That's why Nietzsche is a Zoroastrian. That's the whole point. Why Why is it wrong to kill you if you have every logical reason to do so? That's like the Dostoevsky in question in, in Punishment and Crime, right? Why Why is he tortured with guilt? It, I well, mean, there are... That's, that's a subject. Can, let me just introduce yeah. something that may com combine the, the, the two worlds for a second, because that's also subjective. Um, it's just the biological imperative of survival. Let's just for a second suspend any dis, dis, you know, disagreement and say that we all agree that, that things want to survive. They exhibit a desire to live or, or to, to avoid whatever, a disintegration. Uh, you know, they exhibit a desire to absorb neg entropy, to avoid entropy, whatever the case. Um, as soon as you do that, then you can introduce a set of ethics that correspond to that fundamental desire. I don't know if calling them ethics is quite right necessarily, but it would have to do with what you call efficiency. So now let's imagine that, you know, we're talking about humans and we're talking about how efficient we've been, but how destructive that has been. And so the emergent vector of ethics um, may go from, okay, a very sort of constricted temporal view where this is the best thing for me right now, sort of capitalist gain, ends up sort of having a bunch of ramifications, we grow some knowledge, and as the internet, let's say, combines us and we join a global brain, very easily you could start to see something like what Alung is arguing for, something that looks ethical to you subjectively, being expressed as efficiency globally, because we end up understanding and comprehending uh, cause and effect in increasingly uh, more advanced ways. But why, why, do you, why do you say subjectively? Because like, if you look, let's just say, I'm a, like, I, I make a living as a storyteller, right? The reason why stories even work in the first place, the reason why music work in the first place is because we have shared ideals. Largely, we can have, we can have, we can have slight differences, but we want, like the reason why there are genres, the reason why there's a difference between comedy and tragedy is because yeah. our, our mind are structured to see like good triumph or evil. But are those like, experiences and those, is that strata of shit stuff, great, amazing stuff, is that strata of stuff not born of intersubjectivity? Intersubjectivity, yes, yeah. but that's different. But, but that's different from subjectivity. No, wait, 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 exact same wait, wait, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. When I use the word subjectivity, I use it in a, a more or less timeless way and not in an individualist Western 17th century way. Okay, but let's just, let's just make it... No, there, there's no person 4,000 years ago who was the slightest bit interested in Descartes. Or they would have regarded him as an idiot. So just make sure that when I say subject here, I only mean in a very strictly Hegelian sense. Okay, but let's just make a distinction here between subject and intersubjective, right? Subject so, is always in my philosophy byproduct of intersubjectivity itself. I, I know, I know, I know, but there's still, there's still a distinction. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's still a distinction. Uh, Even if it's... Really. I mean, I mean, so there's a distinction if you're if you're an observer, but as the subject, there's no distinction. There, okay, let me just let me just first make clear that that I actually agree with Bob's definition that like the subject is emerging out of the intersubjective. I would say I would say that the subject emerge out of the collective unconscious, which is basically the same as like tribal awareness to some to some extent. So I would say like. But the, that's the Jungian. The Jungian perspective is that yeah. what the ego is is a border to the collective unconscious, right? Yeah, and there it can be either high. But the reason why then it can be either hyperjective or anojective when it comes out of that process. Yeah, yeah. Anojective, but the reason is, is that we have and hyperjective is being heroic. So that, that, that's exactly. but the but can I? Yeah, I but we have but we have a shit. Okay. No, no, go no, ahead. I, I, this might be interesting. Um, so, in my view, talk about creation. Talk about event. In my view, event and creation happen when you are contentless, when you are actually emptied of your contentions, all the ideas you have about yourself, and you become a vessel and an ingress, and things are moving through you. So when we talk about... Okay, a vessel for what, though? But when we talk about individuation, the Jungian individuation, that's about yeah. sort of subdividing a collective consciousness as your own and sort of reifying and clarifying a, a, a definitive view. And, I, and I'm just saying that that, for me, is, is the wrong approach to, um, <laughs> to the creative individual, to the, in, the kind of individual that is inter, 
that that is an well, ingress as opposed to but a, you, can, okay so can, individuation can, 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 let me just let me just can, answer can, here wait, wait, is individuation can. is integration of sub of subconscious material we would so, not like we you would know not as well as i heard hello listen here we wouldn't use the let word me just, today we would use i, the I do I, i'm a i'm a youngian so i i do use the word individuation call it individuation that's what it is but but let me just let me just finish here so when, when you're creating a work, right? I, I make a living as a writer. So when I'm creating a work, I am creating something. There's a creative advance, but it, I'm still drawing on principles of storytelling, which exist because otherwise it wouldn't be pleasurable. Like one of my, one of my favorite bands is called The Shacks. And the in, in, extremely entertaining thing about The Shacks is that they can't play music at all, but it creates such, but, but the way we measure it is against what is established music. So even abstract methods of art, which seems really creative, are measured against the way we understand structure to begin with. Yeah. So there is like, sorry? Okay. Yeah. Relativism, yeah. Well, there's not relativism because there is a, con there's, well, not necessarily a law-based constant, but there is some principles of storytelling, of music, of like if you move entirely outside they're them, of, which is only entertaining. But the habit of, of nature and the complexity realized at that moment and in that paradigm, which then, of course, right? Though, really but to but, play with. but the, the habits have stayed the same throughout yeah, the entirety ever, of human wait, history. Wait. This is getting and even banal. before that. Wait, this is getting a bit banal, guys. It's becoming content within container. That discussion is heard over and over again. So we could just leave it at that. I, I want to go back to Daniel and Owen and what you're doing with ontological design and how possibly these three mad Alexanders can possibly contribute <laughs> to your projects. Because we, we can go off in so many directions, which is wonderful. And I hope we get a chance to do so again. But listen, we're two and a half hours into this right now. So... Daniel and Owen and ontological design and the absolute madness of your projects. Please tell us more about them. And can these three mad Alexanders possibly contribute to your projects? Yeah. <clears throat> so what we had here, and uh, this, this sounds like the, the cliche ending, was an energetic dynamo between you three, which produced sort of motion. It's a verb. Intelligence emerged through this interrelational space between you guys. And uh, what I'm also interested in uh, is kind of the rules of thumb or some, 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 you know, to circumambulate, to go Jungian, around this, this practice through which the good stuff can come out. Because a lot of stuff can come out. But there's a, a quality of stuff, like high quality stuff, that has the power and the quality to be at the throne behind the barred absolute that has the ability to sway minds and invent realities that people will then follow. Many cults do that from the abusive perspective. They don't create anything, but they, you know, you just hit people a lot and you abuse them and you know, you kind of brainwash them, but there's other stuff that's intrinsic or positive or, or, or whatever it performs. It doesn't need to burn something or to consume something by its own virtue. It shines and, and somehow, moves forward. And sometimes we get so drunk with it. We even call it teleology and Omega points and all that. I don't even care. My point is, where is it? Let's zoom into that. I, I know I'm kind of restating the previous question. I don't know if each of you has any points to do on this. Uh, I think we have a tremendous space, like with, with all three of your perspectives. So I'd be keen on hearing anything you want to. You're talking uh, about Can you just uh, restate it? Where we're, is what? I'm sorry. Go on. Uh, but yeah, well, if, if you have any, anything that comes to mind around, yeah, I, I, um, I, I didn't understand I think, the question. Let, 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 listen to me and Everton, then you get the question. So, so, the, okay. so you can go on. Uh, I call this exodology, but I'd love to hear Ebert's version first of this question. I call it inspiration and exodology. I call it fucking creativity. I call yes, it. This is what it is. It's bringing art beyond just capitalist entertainment. Like That's actually what I, what, what I is back say. at the fucking, the lead. Yes. We're saying let's create a hundred thousand cults and make them fucking fun and weird and wacky and bring participatory drama. Like this is what we're doing in the men's movement, like at the European men's gathering, right? Actually playing out a whole theater over the course of the weekend. I and mean, this is what we need storytellers for. This is what the fucking musicians are doing, right? Actually finding ways to wrap more and more people up in like a playful framing of unfolding in order to understand themselves and get new values. Yeah, man. And, and I think that what, 
I guess, you know, so Bard said, oh, okay, contention and containers. But it's an important point because getting to the point that Fraga just outlined, getting to the point of inspiration, you have to fucking empty yourself. Knowledge at some point becomes an impedance, period. And you have to graduate to wisdom. And I just want to sort of state that, like, we're talking about a bunch of shit, but at the end of the day, you have to kind of get in the zone to get that extra access, you know, to go behind the Bard Absolute. And I think in a lot of ways, what my interpretation so far of the Bard Absolute is, is that readiness to die, is that readiness to like experience not fucking knowing, experience going into the void and coming back. And um, and that takes preparation. So anyway, uh, the name for 100%. that ever beautifully described is pathos. Mm. And it currently we're stuck with logos and mythos, logos and mythos. George Jordan Peterson is stuck between logos and mythos all the time. This is pathos. What you just described is pathos. And that's what's needed right now. But it reminds us of the Hitlers and the Stalins and these mad guys who went out there and used their feelings to make a mark on the world. But I prefer rather than feelings to talk about intuition. And intuition is a beautiful word, I think, here for something. I have no idea where this is heading. I cannot have complete knowledge. It would take a hundred years to get the complete knowledge. And since I don't have the complete knowledge, I use whatever knowledge I have and whatever talent I have within the paradigm where I happen to live, as far as I can understand that paradigm, to tear down the old and build something new. And my word for that is exodology. And the word exodology means today that is going out of an old paradigm into the new one. And this is why I remind people that the problems we have today is that it's the losers to occupy the old institutions of politics, academia, the tired shit of mass media, all the shit they're puking out, television, it's all dead. But it's the losers who take these institutions and scream at the top of the lungs of there because they envy anybody with talent and creativity. Whereas the talented and the creative, like Nietzsche and aristocrats, have to make their mark on the world. But they will now do so in closed rooms behind barred absolutes at sets and cults for the privileged. Welcome to the world of closed digital gated communities where you need to fucking earn a ticket you can't pay. Yes, for. yes. It's not for those who want to or who can purchase it. It's for those who can because the ontological absolute uh, is, the, is that we are always geworfenheit, uh, thrownness. We are in exodus constantly. We're, yeah, and uh, that's called the tensionalism. And I think Dan Schmachtenberg, other guys are getting it too. And that's the death of capitalism. Meaning the mm. most yeah. valuable thing now is sacred and not profane. And capitalism taught us that anything you can sell in the market has become profane because of it. It's like a huge phallic force, brutal mm. force of truth. But what it then left us with after capitalism was, what is there that you love so much you would never ever trade it? Now that's the sacred. And when you start sharing that in a sort of cultural barter, you got the nectocrats and you got the protopians and you got these people that we talk mm, about. Yeah. And that's where we want to aim. Can I just say so what the, uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just, what was the question then where, where inspiration comes from? No, it, you can take it like that. The question was more like, um, do you, looking at this central black hole in the middle of existence that uh, lies simultaneously inside of us, in front of us in the future and in the past, what do you see, you personally, you as a creator, you as a thinker? What's, uh, uh, do you have any advice, any tips? Do you see any into, in, any teleology? Um, oh, okay. Play around with that. Well, I'm, I'm, really I'm very, I actually agree a lot with Ebert on this one, that, that it's more about emptying yourself um, because like there's a part of there's a part of creativity which comes from working, but there's also a large part of creativity where it's being ready to receive inspiration. Yeah, because I and I do, like when I when I write a story and it's going well, I don't feel like it's me writing. It's going precisely. Let, let me throw something. Yeah, here. Rem Kulas, Dutch architect, genius architect, my idol. Um, spoke about systematic idealization, which is what? Mm. Uh, he used it in Delivery's New York. So he looked at New York City and he says, well, usually in architecture, there's a lot of uh, manifestos that never get fulfilled, never get actualized. Mm. In New York, you have a lot of realization, but no manifesto. So he wrote this retroactive manifesto. He tried to say what were the, the tenets behind it? What, what is manifest in there? What is systematic idealization? Is what mm. a diviner does when he throws seashells. It is to garb the void 
with something, you know, you, you can't really see it. It's a black hole, but you throw a, a sheet on top of it. All of a sudden it's a ghost. And in, mm. in, behind the sheet, you can see movement. You can see the hidden messages. You can um, do steganography or, or the word in Portuguese is the mm. calcar. Uh, uh, uh. You can see, you basically see through the veil, but the veil is something you put in there. Mm. Uh, so when you create a story, you put your characters and you create kind of the set, you throw the shells, you, Hmm. give shape spatial temporality and then you let it do its own thing and you just intuit exactly. from it and and i guess that, yeah. that would be a process of systematic idealization something that i think is the modern equivalent of divination yeah exactly if you set up the characters right or the seashells right or you decide on a like a concept for a song it ideally should create itself and you are just like you're just a dick you're a, the notator you are the stenographer, right? You're just notating. And the, uh, uh, so something I, that I'm interested in, right, is like you kind of get it in architecture because you're building a space for people to inhabit. It kind of becomes a permanent ritual. And I think there's mm. this thing about like the work of art more and more being a ritual and not something that is like bourgeois or individual you create in your own room and then you put it out there and people it's, enjoy it. It's like yeah. the live community participation involvement in it is very much the thing. And of course you get that in festival and concerts and whatever, mm. but, but I think, you know, I'm very interested in this like Wagnerian idea of like the total work of art, but moving it beyond being this bourgeois thing. And it's like, how do we actually create the total work of art as our creative ideal in the 21st century. We have all the tools for that. How do we kind of be Wagner little... students yeah, and sorry, don't yeah. go all fucking arts? Well, I, I work with Saadid architects and Saadid once said something really beautiful. She was a woman and Arab and a genius, right? And she said, I love to build for dictators because they don't interfere with my work. <laughs> <laughs> so it is an incredibly complex thing. Incredibly complex question regarding a very complex question. And I don't want to go into some kind of nature romantic idea that the swarm will create things that are beautiful, whereas the mob is evil. Because no, I no, think no. it's sort of swarm mob, good, evil thing. Yeah, but I, I think it's way more complex than that. Sometimes the most stunning things come out of the worst pit holes of the universe, right? So, sure. so I think it makes more sense to speak about it that way rather than going to some kind of hippie bullshit thing that if we just get along together, wonderful things will come out of it. Because I don't think that's actually how it works. Uh, aesthetics, aesthetics breaks constantly with our comfortability. So whenever we get in the logos or the mythos, and the mythos is the childish comfortability and the logos is the autistic comfortability. And what pathos comes back to haunt us with all the time, that's exactly what sexual Sexuality and violence and art are never harmonious, never balanced, ever. They freak us out. And that only then can they can create something really valuable there. And as far as architects are concerned, these days they want to review Dash's urban planner to walk in first and clear the place for them so they can build what they want to build. Because otherwise, if they've got to build the building, they have so many opinions for so many sites that they build something mediocre from day one just to get the job done with. And that's why we build so boring stuff. I think the question of authorship is really important here. Because who's actually designing? The architect? No. No, I, th I, think, I think we were on to something really important before. What I was saying in Hegelian ways that if you think of project and contingency is driving, then subject and necessity can only be constructed in hindsight. So when I work too, and I work creatively, I am in the project. I am project. I'm not subject. Yes. And subject, it's only when I have to close the doors at night and say, I have to go to sleep because I've got to close this down and go to bed and then wake up in the morning and continue. That's when I become a subject. Subject is only something left in the air. Like it's a problem not yet solved. It's an artwork not yet done. And that's where subjectivity comes in. And that is, then I go back into the project again. And I think project is tied to contingency and that's the beauty of it. And that's the shocking beauty, whereas subject and necessity is only in hindsight. Yeah, of course, we would love that work of art. But we didn't know that before it happened, hmm. if we're honest about it. Yeah. Um, I just want to bring up an interesting thing regarding uh, compression. Yes. <laughs> As I just said. Um, so, okay, so one reason why I feel like I, I know that we're approaching a sort of uh, quantitative or qualitative shift in this emergent dialectic is actually because of attentionalism. So if you look at if, and the best way to, to imagine this to me is a waveform in a song. When you master a song, 
more and more what technology is doing is lifting the valleys up to the peaks. It's a pure attentionalism. So what you do is you end up with a loudness effect, which is the attentional war and the salience mapping problems where the valleys are moving up to the peaks and you end up with two dimensions instead of three. Cornoflation. Right? But Edward, 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 that is called vulgar attention or false sure. attention. Sure, sure. But my point but it, is... It's not authentic and it's not lasting. So No, it's not lasting. Fine. But my point is that when that happens in a waveform, what you end up with, if you imagine a high plurality or high dynamism and then the valleys moving up to the peaks, what you end up with when you stand back is a straight line, equilibrium, death, yeah. actual death. And what does that mean? Life's going to happen again. So another sort of qualitative shift is in the works because of this high state of uh, attentionalism. You know, because radio, radio killed rock music precisely for the reason because it just compressed everything to death. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it had to return. It returned to streaming of the earphones again. And suddenly there was dynamic sided back mm-hmm. into the music. And it was sure. much better all of a sudden. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> but we can apply the same thing to just attentionalism itself. So anyway. Just yeah. Want to- so what I, what I call <laughs> that is that when you move the art towards the logos and you end up in the logos, you kill it. And that's exactly what you just described. So that sort of compression in music you talked about is the logical thing to make a track stand out on radio and scream more than the other tracks do. Then you get the influencers of today. And that's why the influencers will be over in no time. They're screaming at the top of their lungs and they're all becoming the same thing because they end up in an, in an area of, of complete compression where there's no difference at all and it's dead. And, and then to add on to that, to just introduce cancer, because I think that, you know, the, when we talk about the behavior of humanity and ethics and is it what's ethical and is there a teleology? Um, so, Cancer cells are, are basically uh, defined by their refusal of apoptosis, which is cellular uh, death, programmed cellular death. Like that's how multicellular organisms get rid of old shit and regenerate. Some cells have to die, but cancer cells say, fuck that. I'm going to live forever. I'm going to pr- reproduce more of myself. Right. And so at some and then, of course, you end up with cancer. You end up with this state where we're consuming the very body that's hosting us. So at some point, I think it would be interesting to reintroduce death or whatever we want to call it, rebirth, um, re, you know, into the conversation so that when we start talking about ethics, we're talking about an integration of death, which equals a holistic behavior. If we want to even get subjective about preference, ethical preference then I think we need to reintroduce death. Completely agree. And that's also the central Christian myth is about no, death and rebirth. No, resurrect Christ. That's the mistake. De- death and die. rebirth. That would have been a tragic death and story. Re- death and I'm... rebirth. No. You have, to be, you have to be reborn to change. No, they ran away from the death of Christ. Death and rebirth is not Christ just Christian. Christ should have huh? been left how to die. We... Like oh, either well, if you... But how well, can we well, he... this idea? Because I'm sure nice, I love he was it. reborn this as an idea. This is the birth of anti-transhumanism, because... and I love it for it. So we do but... ATH from now on. Anti-transhumanism, this is the beginning <laughs> of it. Bring back mortality, and that's what I do in my work constantly. Nothing is, has any meaning without mortality. Sure. Hmm. But when we, you know, when what we was your point? On the subatomic level, because that's potential pertains to that, and, and, and even your insistence lung on, um, on non-determinism, right, requires that some things, you know, this chaos, this element, but why can't we, trans- when we start to transcribe that over to the sociopolitical sort of field and vector, we start to lose um, all, all, all relation to death because we end up with an anthropocentricity where we become humanists and we're trying strictly to preserve humanism as opposed to mm-hmm taking a look at the sort of cyclical regenerative sort of functionality of, you know, including death and, um, and, and, and the irony that of course we would persist far more holistically if we included as, as opposed to sort of obviating it. This is describing priesthood. So when people cannot stand or comprehend their mortality, it's the priest to understand that we're all mortals. So, Priesthood, fundamental priesthood, that's exactly what's so 
absolute aggressive against the supernatural. It's precisely mortality is everything. And everything gets value out of, out of mortality. And we come to a point with that genius out of the bottle. I don't think anybody seriously talks about the afterlife or reincarnation any longer, except for Jordan Peterson, probably. But, you know, it, that's, that's definitely, I'm totally into this. ATH, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Especially, so, yeah, I think we have to distinguish this, between death, death and distinction or extinction, right? So I think, I think the rebirth is, is just as important as the death as well. Yes, also, well, also from like a... That's where the ontological... You can't just say no. No, it's not rebirth. It's called heritage. It's called heritage, not rebirth. That's just stupid. Yeah, we're spring, Her- death and heritage. Well, the, the eternal return, uh, like the, that's the Nietzschean concept. There must be there must be a return and then a change, right? Like... Like going back to the Jesus story, his mom couldn't recognize him. His friends couldn't recognize him. It's cl- like it's clearly not a literal fucking rebirth. Effect. Guys, the- we've had a fantastic almost three-hour conversation. <laughs> we've got to wrap this up. Let's okay. do Christian theology another time, and then yeah, have the religious fight it out. We can <laughs> talk about anything. <laughs> there is yeah, yeah. no topic too big for these five monsters to discuss. And by the way, the two hosts who were slightly more quiet than the three Alexanders in this conversation. <laughs> you guys are the real evil bastards who plan to take <laughs> over and, you know, move your mushrooms into the heads of everybody and start controlling human beings and animals or whatever. I have no idea where this ontological design shit is going, but I love it. And just reinstall install mortality into these processes and force you to the ground. And after that, you could do ontological design that can be absolutely fantastic. And then if Elon wants to live forever, that can be his little prerogative. He's, he's after all, the closet platonist among the five of us. I don't think anyone, anybody else is, but you know, well, yeah. that's, that's we love him for it. <laughs> this has been the rise and the fall of the universe with the Trinity. <laughs> Go figure why you picked that uh, title of all of them. Maybe uh, hmm. that was it. Any final remarks? I love uh, you guys. Yeah, it was really, really enjoyable. Let's do the next one on the death and rebirth of Christianity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the, death, the, the second death of Christ. I want to kill him again. I want, to, I want to bring him back once more after that. Well, but we can keep going that way. Kill, kill him. I'll bring him back. Guys, I'm going to have a steak with the beautiful, wonderful Peter Towson in my house and a glass of red wine and celebrate one of the most okay. fantastic podcasts ever recorded. That's what this <laughs> is. Thank you so much for having me. I really love you guys. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, guys. Gentlemen. We hope you enjoyed the show. Consider becoming our patron and helping us put out more content like this. Patreon.com forward slash techno social.